الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما ووفقنا للعمل به وبرحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد uh, Let's just double check that the connection is working okay And we are at the end of Surah Yusuf and we have to get through Surah al raid and Surah Ibrahim this morning. So there's a lot to do, a lot to do. Uh, we also, again, yesterday we did have a little bit of microphone issues towards the end of the day. Live streaming, I've said to the brothers and sisters, live streaming when you're not in the studio, when you're on location, is not easy. So sometimes we do have stream issues and I'm pretty relaxed about it. I tell the team not to stress too much. If they have an issue, they just talk to me and we have to pause for a minute or two minutes. And when we produce the final edited version of these videos, inshallah ta'ala, we will and remove those things and correct them and what have you. So I just have the reason I'm mentioning it is I saw from the comments that people were getting really stressed that one of the microphones is low, the volume is low. As we said, we knew about it, but we, we had to do our best with what we had. And that happens sometimes and when you're doing a live stream from a location which is not the AMAU studio where we have everything set up nicely. Yeah, you sometimes have, uh, have difficulties in that regard. We're going to start by reading the ayah again. وَرَفَعَ أَبَوَيْهِ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم اغفر لنا ولشيخنا وللمستمعين ولجميع المسلمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال الله تعالى ورفع أبويه على العرش وخروا له سجدا وقال يا أبت هذا تأويل رؤياي من قبل قد جعلها ربي حقا وقد أحسن بي إذ أخرجني من السجن وجاء بكم من البدو من بعد أن نزغ الشيطان من بعد أن نزغ الشيطان بيني وبين إخوتي إن ربي لطيف لما يشاء إنه هو العليم الحكيم And he raised his parents upon the throne and they bowed to him in prostration and he said, O oh my father this is the explanation of my vision of before. My Lord has made it reality. And he was certainly good to me when he took me out of prison and brought you here from Bedouin life after shaitan had induced estrangement between me and my brothers. Indeed, my Lord is subtle in what he wills. Indeed, it is he who is the knowing, the wise. Now, so first of all, this is the conclusion of the dream of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaban was shamsa wal qamara ra'aytuhum li sajideen where he saw 11 stars that is his 11 brothers and he saw the sun and the moon and that is any his father Ya'qub and uh, here the moon was it his mother or did his mother die and it was his and it was his uh, Yani stepmother, uh, that is, yani, there's some Israeliyat with regard to it, but I, I don't know if there is a, yani, I'm not sure that I found a, uh, a text with regard to it in Islam, but it needs some looking into. Yani, ala kulli hal, his parents, yani, uh, they bowed to him out of respect, not out of worship, because bowing out of worship has always been haram. However, in the early Days, bowing out of respect was permitted and in Islam it is not permitted to bow neither out of respect nor out of worship and bowing out of respect is completely and totally prohibited in Islam in any way shape or form and it's very sad a lot of Muslims these days you see people 
bowing out of respect. Even a little bit, they will greet you like this and they'll bow their head. Or, for example, the kids take place in martial arts classes, they take part in them and things like that. And you see people bowing. In Islam, it is utterly prohibited to bow for any reason, respect or culture or otherwise to anybody other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like it was allowed for the Umam al madiyah in some of the previous Umam, out of respect. So when he saw this, this is a Ru'ya Ramziyah. How did we know it's a Ru'ya? How do we know it was a true Ru'ya to begin with? How did we know it was a true vision? First of all, because of the prophethood of Ya'qub alayhi salatu wasalam and the righteousness of Yusuf. We knew that it was a true dream. And then how did we know it was a symbolic dream rather than a real dream? Because there's something unusual in it. The sun does not normally bow, neither do the stars bow to people. So when he saw this, this shows that it's not a normal situation. And so there is a symbolism in it. And that was the symbolism and the dream came true. And then he mentions the blessings of Allah. And I think this is one of the main reasons why the story is mentioned in full. Because to appreciate the blessings upon Yusuf and how Allah Azza wa Jal took him step by step through this journey until he brought his parents back in safety with his brothers reconciled in Egypt. That is, and you have to hear the whole story to appreciate what he's saying. And he, Allah Azza wa Jal took him out of prison. Before that, Allah Azza wa Jal took him out of the well. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took him away from the woman, the wife of Al-Aziz. Allah Azza wa Jal kept him safe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him out of prison. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him to a status of authority in Egypt. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought his brothers back and reconciled them with him. And Allah brought all his family from Bedouin life back into safety. And that, all of it, did it happen directly? What I mean, was it something that was just, you know, he estranged from his brothers and then Allah opened their hearts and they all came back together. It wasn't. It was a very long process of any hidden steps and small events. Each event added to the final conclusion. And this is the meaning of Allah's name, Al-Latif. One of the meanings. One of the meanings of Al-Latif is like Al-Khabir, the one who knows the, the most subtle of, of things. That's one of the meanings of Latif. And he knows the most tiny, minuscule things. But also from the meanings of Al-Latif is the one who is subtle. And I'll give you an example. When you make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal for rizq, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down gold and silver bars from the sky or coins that rain down upon your head? Or do you just wake up and open your eyes and there's a big pile of gold in your room? It's not like that. Is Allah able to do that? Of course He is. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Of course Allah is able for you to wake up and there is a pile of gold in your room. Allah is able for you to go outside and the heavens rain gold and silver coins. Is that normal when you make dua for rizq? It's not. What is normal? Like the story of Yusuf. Things happen that you can't perceive it. One thing leads to another thing, leads to another thing. And before you know it, your dua is answered in a way you could never have expected it to be answered. And this is the meaning of Allah's name, Al-Latif. So Yusuf mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Latif, is Latif for whatever he wills. And also the rivalry and it is caused by the shaitan. Inna shaitan, inna shaitan yanzahu baynakum. Shaitan causes animosity between you. So this which happened with his brothers, Yusuf mentions that this is from the shaitan. The shaitan is the one who put this between him and between his brothers and then reconciled, and they were reconciled by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رب قد آتيتني من الملك وعلمتني من تأويل الأحاديث فاطر السماوات والأرض أنت ولي في الدنيا والآخرة 
توفني مسلما وألحقني بالصالحين My Lord, you have given me something of sovereignty and taught me sovereignty, sovereignty and taught me of the interpretation of dreams, creator of the heavens and earth. You are my protector in this world and the hereafter. Cause me to die a Muslim and join me with the righteous. And this is the dua of Yusuf when he sensed and felt the blessing of Allah upon him. He called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He praises Allah for what Allah has given him. And he praises Allah for Allah's actions. The creator of the heavens and the earth. The one who gave Yusuf authority in Egypt. The one who taught Yusuf the interpretation of dreams and how to manage the outcome of events. And he, te- he says that Allah Azza wa Jal is his protector. And the one and he, that, that he is the one and he... Yani that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Yusuf is a, one of Allah's beloved servants that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of him and, and protected him. And then he makes his request, cause me to die as a Muslim and join me with the righteous. Tawafani Musliman wa alhiqani bisalih. ذلك من أنباء الغيب نوحيه إليك وما كنت لديهم إذ أجمعوا أمرهم وهم يمكرون That is from the news of the unseen which we reveal, O Muhammad, to you and you were not with them when they put together their plan while they conspired The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not present for this story and He was not present when all these things happened Look at the detail which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells him Every single thing that happened in this story What happened to Yusuf when he was in the depths of the well? What happened to Yusuf when he was in the prison? The conversation that he had with the people in the prison And what happened with Yaqub in his absence in all of this, nobody knew it except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jal brought it together, Ahsan al Qasas, the most beautiful of stories, along with the beauty of the language, along with the beauty of the lessons that it contains. And we spoke about this in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal regarding Ahsan al Qasas, the best of stories. وما أكثر الناس ولو حرست بمؤمنين. And most of the people, although you strive for it, are not believers. And even when they are given the clearest of signs from Allah Azza wa Jal, and even when they see that this Quran can only be from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and even when you strive to convince them and show them, most of them do not believe. وما تسألهم عليه من أجر إن هو إلا ذكر للعالمين. And you do not ask of them for any payment. It is not except a reminder to the worlds. Yeah. That was the nature of the prophets, عليهم الصلاة والسلام. They didn't ask the people for payment. And we mentioned this before that the da'ya is not befitting for the person who gives da'wah to be someone who is known for taking the people's money. Sahih, a person can earn a salary, a person could have a job in da'wah, but, or be a teacher, but it shouldn't be the case the person is known for it. I, mean, I will not, I don't give you a benefit unless you pay me for it. And that is, I mean, people, people's hearts don't accept it, even if it is permissible. I mean, even if we said that that is permissible, the hearts of the people don't accept it. And that was the nature of the prophets. And if somebody is giving you these beautiful lessons and this beautiful instruction, and they're not asking anything from you, then you have to think very seriously about the message that you're being given. 
وَكَأَيٍّ مِّنْ آيَةٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَمُرُّونَ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ عَنْهَا مُعْرِضُونَ And how many a sign within the heavens and earth do they pass over while they, therefrom, are turning away? وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ And most of them believe not in Allah except while they associate others with Him. This is a very important ayah. Rather, this ayah is a fundamental principle in the topic of Tawheed and Shirk. وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ most of them do not believe in Allah except that they make partners with Him. Taib, what is the principle here? The principle here is how, or the issue here is how do we join between the fact that they believe in Allah but they make shirk? Because Allah tells they believe in Allah. And here the Sahaba, they give the tafsir of the ayah. There is tafsir of the ayah from the Sahaba. And there is tafsir of it from the tabi'een. If it is said to them, who created the heavens and the earth, they will say Allah, and yet they worship other than Him. This is very important. My dear brothers and sisters, we have said so many times that the majority of shirk in this ummah and before this ummah is shirk on fit fil uluhiyya. It is shirk in worshipping Allah alone, not shirk in rububiyya. I'm not saying shirk in rububiyyah doesn't exist. It does. I'm not saying that shirk in rububiyyah did not exist in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. In some aspects, yes. But it's not the argument between the Prophet and his people. The Prophet ﷺ did not come to his people and say, I need to tell you that Allah exists. His people did not fight him over that. They did not, he did not come and say, I need to tell you that Allah is your creator. They didn't fight him over that. The fight with him was over worshipping Allah alone. So when you say to them, Man khalaqa samawati wal ard, la yakulunna Allah, they will say, Allah created the heavens and the earth. We're going to come to the ayat in Surah Al Mu'minun and in other surahs of the Quran where the, where the kuffar, and some have already passed, where they are asked question after question who sends down the rain? Who brings out the living from the dead? Who brings out the dead from the living? Who controls everything in the universe? They don't hesitate, they say, Allah. So why do you worship others besides him? So the kuffar, they have a type of iman in Allah. And in most of the kuffar, they have a type of iman in Allah. Hatta the Jewish person, Christian person, they have a type of iman in Allah. What is their type of iman in Allah? Generally speaking, it falls under the issue of ar-rububiyyah. That Allah exists, that he's the Lord, the creator, the sustainer. وَهُمْ يَعْبُدُونَ غَيْرَهُ But they worship other than Allah besides Him. And this ayah you will find the scholars mentioning it in the books of Tawheed. And it's extremely important. وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مشركون. Most of them do not believe in Allah, i.e. in Allah's lordship, except that they are mushrikun in Allah's worship. And that tafsir came from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. It's not a modern tafsir. And this is what they understood. If it said to them, who created the heavens and the earth? They say, Allah, وَهُمْ يَعْبُدُونَ غَيْرَهُ And they worship others besides Him. أَفَأَمِنُوا أَن تَأْتِيَهُمْ غَاشِيَةٌ مِّنْ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ أَوْ تَأْتِيَهُمُ السَّاعَةُ بَغْتَةً وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Then do they feel secure that they will not overcome, that they will not overcome to them an overwhelming aspect of the punishment of Allah or that the hour will not come upon them suddenly while they do not perceive? Any agashiyah is a punishment which covers you. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُو إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Say, 
this is my way. I invite to Allah with insight. Uh, I and those who follow me and exalted is Allah and I am not of those who associate others with him. SubhanAllah, the difficult thing in this tafsir class is that sometimes you stop on an ayah. I took this ayah and explained it. I think it took three days. We did the, the, the explanation of this ayah. Not strictly only the ayah, but yani, around the ayah. And it was a three, not three full days, like three sessions, yani, three two-hour sessions or something like that. Like, and we just don't have the time yani, to go through the whole thing. But I will try to point out some points. This ayah is probably the most fundamental proof in the way that you give da'wah. The Prophet ﷺ is told to say, Qul hadihi sabili. Say, this is my way. What is my way? And he, this is my way in da'wah. This is my way in giving da'wah. And the job of the prophets was to call people to Allah. This is the way that I call to Allah. Ad'u ilallah. I call to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't call to himself. He didn't call to politics. He didn't call to people's desires. He didn't call to any tribalism. He called to Allah. So the first condition of the da'wah of anyone who wants to give da'wah in a way that is pleasing to Allah is that their call should be to Allah, not to them. I'm not trying to build followers. I'm not trying to build people who are on my side. My job is to call people to Allah. And that's what should be important. People shouldn't listen to, to me telling, talking to them about Islam and get the impression that it's about me. And my job is to call people to Allah. And that's why the da'wah of anything which is not built on a sincere call to Allah is a failure. And so many of the tawa'if and the firaq al dala the misguided groups, they call to other than Allah. And their primary da'wah is not a da'wah to Allah. It is a da'wah to their bid'ah or a da'wah to their desires or a da'wah to politics or a da'wah to people's personal issues or a, yani a da'wah of personalities. But it's not a da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani the da'wah, it should be to Allah. Ad'u ila Allah. Ala basira upon insight. The ulama, they say there are three types of insight that the da'iyah should have. Number one, the da'iyah should have insight about the religion of Islam. Now that doesn't mean that you have to be an alim to give da'wah. What's the delil? Because the ayah indicates you have to be an alim, right? That, that could be understood from the ayah. What's the delil? That you don't have to be an alim to give da'wah. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Convey from me, even if it is only one ayah. And the action of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, not all of them, for example, I memorized the whole Quran, not all of them. And he had, and he, for example, spent a long, long time with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what is a condition is that whatever you speak about Islam, you know what you're saying. If you have limited knowledge of Islam, then give da'wah in a limited way. There's no, why, why would you think that's a bad thing? Some people feel like they have to answer everything. Wallahi, it really pains me. It really, it hurt me, wallahi, to see the situation of some of the du'at who are good du'at. Yani they really, many, many people accepted Islam from them. But what happened was the da'iyah started to speak about things they don't have knowledge of. And when you listen to them, you know they don't have knowledge of it. And you learn what, speak about what you know. If what you know is, is a basic explanation of what Islam is and calling people to Islam, that's what you know. Speak about what you know. The second thing that you have basira of is you have basira of the person you're giving da'wah to. That means that you should know the person you're speaking to. Now, it doesn't mean you know everything about them, but be careful about making assumptions in da'wah. So one of the assumptions people make in da'wah is they meet someone, for example, and because they're in a certain country, let's say they're in England, they presume that person is a Christian, for example. Or because that person says, I'm a Christian, they presume that they believe in the Bible, for example. 
And so they start telling them about the Bible. I saw this happen once. I saw a brother, and I've said this in my da'wah course, yeah, I saw a brother, and he's talking to another brother. I'm just watching from the doorway. He's talking to a non-Muslim. So he's telling a non-Muslim, John chapter something, verse whatever, and in Matthew, Mark, and this is a contradiction. And the guy is, is retaking it really well. I thought, wow, he's, ta he's taking this well for a, for a Christian. You know, the guy's just tearing apart the Bible and this guy's just nodding, you know, it's like, really? It's like, yeah, and Matthew, and then if you look in the Old Testament and he was going for it, the man was nodding, yeah, yeah, okay, wow, really? I never knew that. So the 15 minutes, okay, call it 10 minutes goes by. And then finally, the da'ya runs out of breath. So he takes a pause. He goes, so? He said, it was really interesting, but I don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, wallahi, that's what he said. He says, really interesting, but I don't believe in the Bible. Like, not in a bad way, but like, I don't personally believe in the Bible. Like, I mean, it's really interesting what you've told me, but I don't actually believe in the Bible. The daddy made two mistakes. The first mistake is he didn't know the person he's speaking to. So for example, if, if you meet a Christian, you can't presume any, that they, for example, that they believe in the Trinity as an example. And, but ask them, say, as a Christian, do you, is, it, is it true that you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as part of a Trinity? And then you answer. What's the second mistake the Da'i made? He didn't take it from the Quran. He didn't take it from the Quran. Did you ever see the Prophet ﷺ come and talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or Genesis and Exodus and... Our da'wah is a da'wah to Allah through the Qur'an. We do not need to be experts in the Bible. I'm not saying that it doesn't hurt. And there's no, there is no, I'm not saying that it's any, there's no harm in someone, certain people having expertise in the, 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 what we would call al-adyan wal-firaq. What do the different religions believe? There's nothing wrong with that. Any someone knows the details of what Christians believe so that he can give da'wah, there is nothing wrong with that. But wallahi, this da'wah is a da'wah bid'iyyah, an innovative da'wah, which is calling people to Islam from the Bible. And I don't know any of the Salaf who are upon this, any one of them, calling people to Islam through the Bible. You call people to Islam through the Qur'an, not through the Bible, not through any biblical study. Akhi, how do you have time for biblical study? Do you not have time, Yani Umar, did the Prophet ﷺ not rebuke him for holding the Torah in his hand? The Prophet ﷺ became furious with him for holding the Torah, for holding pages of the Torah in his hand. He became furious with him. And he rebuked him with the strongest rebuke. And he said to him, if Musa was alive, he would have had no choice but to follow me. How can you spend hours and days and years of your life studying the Torah and the Injil as a Muslim? It's enough to have a ma'rifah of it And certain people specialize in that deen So they have a knowledge of what it is And that's it To have a knowledge of, of what that person is upon As for memorizing There are people memorize the Bible And you Muslims What are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? Have you finished Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim? And the Kutub al-Sitta And Muslim Imam Ahmad Have you really memorized that much That you have time to sit and memorize the Bible? Tell me how many of the Sahaba memorized the Torah and after they accepted Islam. For Allah, this is a da'wah bid'iyyah. And it's an innovative da'wah. And it's not from Islam at all to give da'wah like that. Sahih, have a ma'rifah of, of, of the scripture, no problem. They know certain little points. And sometimes I say to people, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? They say yes. So I'll say to them, what's the first commandment? Is it not... La ilaha illallah. Hear, O Israel, that your God is one God. You have no God except Him. Is it not La ilaha illallah? Where do you stand with regard to La ilaha illallah? But that itself yani, is taken from the Quran, not from the Bible. Well, yani, yani, every messenger was sent with La ilaha illallah. For the point is, yani, this yani, comparative religion, we took it way beyond where it should be. I don't mind there being certain specialists, but it got to a stage where you know, sometimes that person 
you never hear from them an ayah of the Qur'an. You just hear from them Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Wallahu musta'an. So the person should have knowledge of who you're talking to and a general understanding of what that person believes. The third thing you should have knowledge of is you should have knowledge of your limits. Knowledge of where your limits are and know when to stop. Know when to say, I don't know the answer. Did not the Prophet ﷺ do the same thing when they asked him about the hour? The people ask you, when will the hour be? Did the Prophet ﷺ not say, قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ I don't know the answer to that. That's not from one of the things I know. I, I don't know how to answer that question. Know where your limits are. Because if you don't know where your limits are, wallahi, it's so easy to cross the limits. Know what the limits of your knowledge, the limits of what you're allowed to answer and what you're not allowed to answer. For example, a da'iyah could easily be in a situation where he's asked or she's asked a question about something that they don't have knowledge of. And the, te- the habit is to answer anyway because your pressure, you know, especially this like people are going back and forth, this jidal is happening and people are pushing you and what's your answer to this? And the person doesn't know their own limits. So they answer something they don't have knowledge of. They answer something they don't have knowledge of. And it's very dangerous, wallah. And it's from Al-Qawl Allah. Speaking about Allah without knowledge. A person has to be careful. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, it was told to say yani, by Allah Azawajal, Ana wa man Me and those who follow me. And this shows you that the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ, that the way of da'wah, that da'wah is tawqifiyyah. We say to the brothers again, Ad-da'watu ibadah. Wal aslu fil ibadat at tawqif Da'wah is an ibadah. Or it's not an ibadah. It's an ibadah. And what is the basic principle with regard to ibadat? You have to do them the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. Therefore, da'wah is tawqifiyah. You do not have the right to give da'wah however you personally feel. Sahih, there is flexibility in what the Prophet ﷺ did. Writing, yani maybe speaking on a yani recorded, yani maybe, for example, speaking in person, all of these, yani, for example, the Prophet ﷺ spoke in person and the Prophet ﷺ had letters written and the Prophet ﷺ sent Sahaba to transmit the message. And there's some flexibility in areas. You don't have a flexibility in the methodology of da'wah. It's tawqifiyya. It is how the Prophet ﷺ did it. So your da'wah, first of all, is da'wah to tawheed because that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. And you don't have an option to make your da'wah, first of all, da'wah to something else. It has to be the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. أَنَا وَمِنِ التَّبَعْنِ وَسُبْحَانَ Subhanallah, it means that Allah is exalted and free of all imperfections. And this, again, should be the purpose of the da'iyah. Any two, free the people of misconceptions about Allah. Because subhanAllah is a statement of Allah's perfection Therefore, what is being said, yani that the job of the da'iyah is to free the people of misconceptions about Allah. And from these misconceptions, they said that Allah took a son. Subhana. Perfect is he. Exalted is he. And Allah didn't take a son. For the job of the da'iyah is to remove misconceptions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hearts of the people so they can accept Islam. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ That the job of the da'iyah is at tawheed and to warn the people against shirk. To call the people to tawheed and warn the people against shirk. And the statement وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ also contains الْوَلَاء bara. It contains that my allegiance is to Islam and the Muslims, and it contains clarity about your da'wah. My dear brothers and sisters, our da'wah is a da'wah upon bayina, upon clarity. It's not a da'wah which is unclear, which is muddy. You can't see what I'm really saying. 
And when you listen to me, you should know clearly what I'm upon. It should not be this, any like, I can't see what your da'wah is. I don't know what you're calling to. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ I'm calling to Tawheed. I'm warning the people against shirk. This should be absolutely crystal clear. The da'ya should be, their da'wah should be a da'wah which has clarity and which the people have no confusion about what they're calling them to. Uh, all of these are some of the points that can be taken. And uh, we did have some uh, workshops before on the topic of da'wah. Some of them were recorded in which uh, the ayah was explained in more detail along with some of the evidences to support it. But that's a summary, inshallah, for what we have time for now. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبَلِكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقُرَى أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبَلِهِمْ وَلَدَارُ الْآخِرَةِ خَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا and we sent not before you as messengers except men to whom we reveal from among the people of cities. So have they not traveled through the earth and observed how was the end of those before them? And the home of the hereafter is best for those for those who fear Allah. Then will you not be will you not reason? Any best for the people of taqwa. Here, best for the people of taqwa. I said I I personally feel that. Any fear is not the whole story. Any so you, I think taqwa is best to be translated as taqwa, unless you say something like to to protect yourself from Allah's punishment. I can hear as an evidence. The evidence that all of the prophets were men, uh, and that Maryam, alayhi salatu wasalam, she was not a prophet, rather she was a siddiqa. As Allah Azawajal said, wa ummuhu siddiqa. Because there is any, there were people who said about Maryam, because of what happened to her. Like in the view that is correct, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. The only people we sent as prophets were men. And that is because of the characteristics that Allah placed within men and the any certain qualities that Allah placed within them that make it, them suitable to be people to carry their prophethood. And Allah Azza wa Jal, Allahu A'lam, Haythu Yajaru Risalata. Allah knows better who to give prophethood to. Hatta Ida stay as a Rusulu Wadanu Anna Hum Kadakudibu Jaa Hum Nasruna Fanujia Manasha. ولا يرد بأسنا عن القوم المجرمين. They continued until, when the messengers despaired and were certain that they had been denied, they came to them our victory, and whoever he willed was saved. Now punishment cannot be repelled from the people who are criminals. And when they despaired, what did they despair of? Because we heard, إنه لا يأس من روح الله إلا القوم الكافرون. The people who despair of Allah's help are the kuffar. So the messengers don't despair of Allah's help. Yani they despair of the people, not of Allah's help. Yani meaning, I don't believe that there's anyone left among these people who is going to, yani, uh, who will believe. And that's why the ayah itself explains what is meant by it. In status means vannu annahum qad kudibu. It means that they believed that that nobody else would believe among their people. Yani that's it seems like no one else. Allah has not written guidance for anyone else among our people. The help of Allah came, meaning that Allah saved the prophets and punished those who. Disbelieved. For example, we've heard Nuh and we've heard about uh, Hud and Salih. And in all of the prophets, that when they uh, 
يعني when those prophets when they reached a stage where their people decided firmly upon kufr so Allah Azza wa Jal sent his help and saved those prophets and those who believed with them and destroyed those who disbelieved and that's يعني the meaning ولا يرد بأسنا عن القوم المجرمين يعني no one from the criminal people or from anyone else for that matter can repel the punishment of Allah when it comes any how strong they are how powerful they are how many armies and how much money they have but they cannot when the punishment of Allah comes they cannot divert it from themselves لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب ما كان حديثا يفترى ولكن تصديق الذي بين يديه وتفصيل كل شيء وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون There was certainly in their stories a lesson for those of understanding. Never was it a narration invented but a confirmation of what was before it and a detailed explanation of all things and guidance and mercy for people who believe. Any a lesson here means lessons. Yani there were many 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 things that al ibra you have to yani the word ibra uh what ibra means is that it is something that you take a lesson from it any an event that happened that you took a lesson from it you learned from it so when you see what those prophets did what happened to them and what happened to their people and the story of yusuf alayhi salatu wassalam any what you see is that in what happened to them there are many things that you can take on board and you can learn from and that shows that these stories are not stories for the sake of stories it's not a bedtime story to make you any feel good before you go to sleep any there are ibar there are lessons to be learned things to be taken benefits to be extracted uh saidi rahimahullah ta'ala in this place in his tafsir i think pages and pages he talks about the benefits of the story of yusuf But wallahi, a person, if they went back to that and read it, they will understand what is meant by عبرة لأولي الألباب يعني Not everybody will be able to take those benefits. But the person of intellect, the person of understanding, will be able to take many, many benefits and lessons from the stories that Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about Al-Umam al Madiya, the previous nations. It is not an invented speech. Because what's the nature of the storytellers? Is usually the storytellers make up things. Storytellers lie. <clears throat> storytellers make up things. Storytellers embellish it. They exaggerate. They add a bit of, you know, spice onto the mix. This Quran is a completely truthful record of everything that it says, and the Prophet ﷺ did not invent it. Rather, it gives truth to that which came before. And this is appropriate for the stories of the prophets because it connects you to them. And in other words, the Quran tells you the true story of Yusuf, part of which is mentioned in the Torah and the Injil. And you know the story of Yusuf is mentioned in the Torah and the Injil. But this Quran gives you the true story. And it confirms Yani what is true and what is not true from that which is mentioned in the Torah and the Injil because no doubt the Yahud and the Nasara they made lies against their prophets in certain aspects they made lies yani their statement that Nuh was a drunkard that he lay drunk in his tent and, and this is a lie wallahi it's a lie against the prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wassalam and their statements yani their statement that Yaqub wrestled with Allah and All of this is يعني, من أبطل الأباطيل It's from the biggest of lies So the Quran tells us what is true and what is not true From the previous scripture And it also You can, you can know the truth of the Quran By the fact that It is 
a continuation of the previous scripture. And it is a guidance and a mercy for a people who believe. And we've spoken about that in other ayat, that only the people who believe will take its guidance and will take mercy from it. And inshallah, that brings us to the end of Surah Yusuf. Yani, to be honest, it's, it's hard because it's very, very fast. We had to go through it. And if I, I want to make it, I keep saying it, but I want to just emphasize one more time. If I go through an ayah and I leave it and I just say, carry on, don't think that that's because there's no tafsir to be said. Yani. That's just because we, for time reasons, if something has been understood in a basic way, often I won't explain it. If it's, been, if it's easy to understand it in a simple way, and we'll, we'll carry on just for the purpose of finishing the Qur'an. Later on, if you go to a tafsir lesson, maybe that one ayah that I just said, carry on, maybe the shaykh will, will spend yani, an hour telling you about it. But there's a lot to learn, but we're just going through in a basic way to get a basic understanding. And now we're going to start with Surah Al-Ra'id. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alif Lam تلك آيات الكتاب والذي أنزل إليك من ربك الحق ولكن أكثر الناس لا يؤمنون ألف لام ميم وراء These are the verses of the book and what has been revealed to you from your Lord is the truth but most of the people do not believe. And this is a surah that the scholars differed about whether it is Makkiya or Madaniya. But one of the things I wanted the uh, brothers and sisters to know about, uh, and I think it's important, is to know that the Makki and Madani surahs is not based on the content. Generally speaking, we, the content can be maybe an, an, an indicator, but the content is not how we decide whether a surah is Makkiya or Madaniya. But we decide whether a surah is Makkiya or Madaniya. We decide that based on the narrations regarding it being revealed. And what did the scholars of tafsir take from the tabi'een and from the sahaba about the surah? Otherwise, we don't look and say this surah deals with, for example, it mentions jihad, so it must be Madani or Madaniya. And it mentions, for example, a lot about la ilaha illallah and any the stories of the prophet so it must be makkiya rather it's not like that it should be based on a proof for some of the surahs there's a disagreement about them in surah al-ra'd al-sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala he said madaniya wa qila makkiya he said it's it, he believes that it's a madani surah but some of the scholars took the view that it is a makki surah naam <coughs> الله الذي رفع السماوات بغير عمد ترونها ثم استوى على العرش وسخر الشمس والقمر كل يجري لأجل مسمى يدبر الأمر يفصل الآيات لعلكم بلقاء ربكم توقنون It is Allah who erected the heavens without pillars that you can see. Then he established then himself. He rose, then yeah. he rose above the throne and made subject the sun and the moon, each running its course for a specified term. He arranges each matter. He details the signs that you may of the may of the meeting with your Lord be certain. وَهُوَ الَّذِي مَدَّ الْأَرْضَ وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ وَأَنْهَارَ وَمِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ جَعَلَ فِيهَا زَوْجَيْنِ اثْنَيْنِ يُغْشِي اللَّيْلَ النَّهَارَ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And it is he who spread the earth and placed therein firmly set mountains and rivers. And from all of the fruits he made therein two mates, he causes the night to cover the day. Indeed, in that are signs for people who give thought. And all of these are signs of Allah Azza wa Jal in his creation. If you look at the heavens that is raised without any pillars you can see, 
يعني the throne is Allah's the greatest of Allah's يعني أعظم المخلوقات يعني the greatest of the the created objects that Allah subhanahu wa taala created. If you look at the fact that Allah subhanahu wa taala subjugated the sun and the moon, and He made it for the benefit of the people, and the sun moves in such a way that it benefits people, and the moon moves in such a way that it benefits people. The fact that Allah Azza wa controls everything in the universe, the fact that Allah is the one who spread out the earth and placed the mountains and rivers, and the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created any fruits of every kind. Uh, yani in pairs In pairs some of them said yani Male and female Some of them said sweet and bitter Some of them said yani All of these are pairs yani Allah has made contrasting pairs The fact that the day comes into the night And the night comes into the day All of these indicate what? They indicate that Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala Who is Al-Rabb Al-Khaliq Al-Mudabbir The Lord The Creator And the Controller is the one who is deserving of worship alone. And when you add to that, that these signs bring you to the Sharia, they bring you to the revelation, the Wahi. And the Wahi tells you how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to live your life. And you don't look at the sun and say, Allah wants me to pray five times a day. These ayat, they give you the meaning of the oneness of Allah, ijmalan la tafsilan. And I think similar to that is narrated from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Yani these things, they give you the overview of the oneness of Allah, not the details of it. So when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and the night and the day, it gives you an idea. Yani from that, you come out with the idea that there is one God alone controlling the universe and he deserves to be worshipped. But the details of how to worship him, praying five times a day, and any what are his names and his attributes and his actions, any this is what you take from the wahi, from revelation. <laughs> وفي الأرض قطع متجاورات وجنات من أعناب وزرع وزرع without that you you're mixing with سورة الأنعام. <coughs> وفي الأرض قطع متجاورات وجنات من أعناب وزرع ونخيل ونخيل صنوان وغير صنوان يسقى بماء واحد ونفضل بعضها على بعض في الأكل إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يعقلون. And within the land are neighboring plots and gardens of grape vines and crops and palm trees, growing several from a root or otherwise, watered with one water, but we make some of them exceed others in quality of fruit. Indeed, that and in that are signs for people who reason. Naam. Yani the neighboring plots and the gardens of grapevines, the crops, the, the, the crops that grow from a single root, yani all of them have a shared root. And those that grow individually, all of them are watered with the same water. Yani the same water comes down and makes each one of them grow. And some of them are better than others in taste and in quality. All of these are a sign for a people who reason. Yeah. <laughs> وَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ And if you are astonished, O Muhammad, then astonishing is their saying, when we are dust, will we indeed be brought into a new creation? 
Those are the ones who have disbelieved in their Lord and those will have shackles upon their necks. And those are companions of the fire. They will abide there in eternity. So first of all, uh, if you are amazed or Muhammad or astonished, astonished is a good word. If you're astonished, any by those who die the, deny the resurrection, any after they've seen these signs, how can anyone deny the resurrection? A single rain falls down from the sky, a single earth grows all of those different plants. How can you deny the resurrection? And if this astonishes you that they deny the resurrection, then truly it is astonishing that they say, when we are dust, will we be brought to a new creation? Those are the ones who have disbelieved in their Lord and they will have shackles upon their necks, any iron collars and any uh, chains. And they are the people of the fire. وَيَسْتَعْجِلُونَكَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ قَبَلَ الْحَسَنَةِ وَقَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمُ الْمَثُولَاتِ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَذُو مَغْفِرَةٍ لِلنَّاسِ عَلَى ظُلْمِهِمْ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَشَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ They impatiently urge you to bring about evil before good. While there has already occurred before them similar punishments to what they demand. And indeed, your Lord is the possessor of forgiveness for the people, despite their wrongdoing. And indeed, your Lord is severe in penalty. Any similar punishments or exemplary punishments? Any punishments, I, I quite like the word exemplary punishments in, in Muhsin Khan. Any punishments that were designed to be a lesson for the people. And they ask you to bring about their punishment. We know that the non-Muslims, they used to say, and you bring about this punishment if you are truthful. Bring us what you promised us. If they ask for this torment to be brought and not for the Allah's rahmah, they don't say to the Prophet ask your Lord to have mercy on us. They say ask your Lord to punish us. Already many exemplary punishments passed before. Many times people were punished and made an example of in the people of Ad, Thamud, Madian, the people of Fir'aun, any exemplary punishments were given to them, punishments that were a lesson for all mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives people despite their oppression. It is an opportunity for forgiveness, or people of Quraysh, or people of, any of the disbelievers, there is an opportunity for you now to get Allah's forgiveness. And Allah is severe in punishment. So joining between al-raja wal khawf, hope in Allah's mercy and fear of Allah's punishment. وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَةٌ مِّن رَبِّهِ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُنْذِرٍ and those who disbelieved say, Why has a sign not been sent down to him from his Lord? You are only a warner, for every people is a guide. And they say, Why has a sign not been sent down? And what they mean here is, This is the reason we don't believe. And the reason we don't believe in you is an acceptable sign has not been sent to us. When in reality, you are only a warner. And for every people is a guide. And guidance is of two types. Guidance of irshad and guidance of tawfiq. The guidance of irshad is the guidance of showing people what is right and what is wrong. And that is the job of the prophets alayhim wassalam, and the job of the people of knowledge, the ulama, to show people what is right and what is wrong. As for at tawfiq this is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sahih, Allah shows you what is right and wrong. That's also, and that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but there are people that can show you what is right and wrong. But as for the success to follow it, that is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prophets were sent to show people what is right and wrong. As for who accepts it, that is in the hands of Allah alone. 
الله يعلم ما تحمل كل أنثى وما تغيض الأرحام وما تزداد وكل شيء عنده بمقدار <تصفيق> Allah knows what every female carries and what the wombs lose prematurely or exceed and everything with him is by due measure يعني Allah عز وجل knows what is in the wombs he knows any how long the child will stay those that are born prematurely those that will stay those that are born past their due date allah azza wa jalla knows whether they are going to be a single baby or twins any all of this is from what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and allah knows how that baby will be Will they be from the people of paradise or from the people of the hellfire? Alimu al-ghaybi wa shahadati al-kabiru al-muta'al He is Noah of the unseen and the witness, the grand, the exalted. Naam, al-kabir is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the grand. Al-muta'al, this is part of the names of al-ulu, the names of highness. Because remember the names of highness like Al-Ali, Al-A'la, Al-Muta'al. These are the three names that came with the meaning of highness, right? Sabbih isma rabbika Al-A'la in Ayat Al-Kursi wa huwa Al-Ali Al-Azim. And in this ayah, Al-Kabir, Al-Muta'al. And these three names, all of them deal with Al-Ulu. And all of them have Ulu Al-Zat and Ulu Al-Qadr and Ulu Al-Qahr. All of them have the ulu of that Allah Himself is high above His creation, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in status is high above His creation, and that Allah in His power over His creation is high above them. And all of these things, Allah Azza wa Jal is, yani al al Ali al Aala al Mutaal. سواء منكم من أسر القول وما جهر به ومن هو مستخف بالليل وسارب في سواء منكم من أسر القول وما جهر به ومن هو مستخف بالليل وسارب بالنهار is the same to him concerning you whether one conceals his speech or publicizes it and whether one is hidden by night or conspicuous 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 huh? among others by day it doesn't matter whether you keep your speech secret whether you think it in your heart whether you publicly say something whether you're hidden alone in the darkness of the night or publicly walking among the people in the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where you are what you do what you say and what you think lahu mu'aqqibatun min bayn yadayhi wa min khalfihi yahfazunahu min amri Allah إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم وإذا أراد الله بقوم سوءا فلا مرد له وما لهم من دونه من وال For him are successive angels before and behind him who protect him by the decree of Allah Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. And when Allah intends for a people ill, there is no repelling it. And there is not for them, besides Him, any patron. Patron. Yeah. Patron. And here, it should be, protector is better. And you say protector makes more sense. In his successive angels, the angels that guard a person, the angels that guard a person, they have two shifts. They, in the day, yani in the day and the night. A group come at Fajr and leave at Asr, and a group come at Asr and leave at Fajr. And those angels come together in the Fajr prayer and the Asr prayer. Any those angels, 
they are together, yani, the two groups are together in the Fajr prayer and the Asr prayer. These are the Mu'aqibat. They protect him by the decree of Allah or they protect him from yani, uh, the, they protect him by the decree of Allah or we could say that they protect him from everything except the decree of Allah. And both of them are true. So they protect him by Allah's decree. And Allah decrees the angels to protect. And they protect him from something happening to him which is not decreed for him. And those angels are the guardian angels. They protect you from something happening to you that is not decreed for you. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. This is more general than uh, the ayah that we heard previously, but the meaning we explained it before. And when Allah Azza wa Jal intends ill for a people, in the meaning of intending ill for a wisdom that is with him and justice, in Allah does not intend ill for a people for no reason. And out of wisdom and justice, no one can repel it and there is no protector besides him. هو الذي يريكم البرق خوفا وطمعا وينشئ السحاب الثقال It is he who shows you lightning causing fear and aspiration and generates the heavy clouds Any what do you fear about lightning and what do you hope about lightning Any it causes you fear that you'll be struck by it. Uh, but it also causes you hope that the rain will fall. So it, and it causes you fear and hope. And Allah produces heavy clouds now. Or, and the, any, naam, from it comes the heavy clouds. Now it's here the, the Muhsin Khan's translation is better. It's he who brings up the clouds. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who brings out the heavy clouds. And <laughs> وَهُمْ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي اللَّهِ وَهُوَ شَدِيدُ الْمِحَالِ And the thunder exalts Allah with praise of Him and the angels as well from fear of Him and He sends thunderbolts and strikes there with whom He wills while they, were, while they dispute about Allah and He is severe in assault. I don't like severe in assault doesn't really, the meaning isn't conveyed. I think tremendous in might from the clear Quran is easier to understand. And the thunder praises Allah. We've heard in the birds and the animals, every single one of them praises Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you hear the thunder, you what you hear, you hear the sound of the thunder. But in the reality, the thunder praises Allah. But you don't understand the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here also praises Allah. Uh, it says, exalts the praise of him. That's how it should be, exalts the praise. It joins between a tasbih and al-hamd. A tasbih is to declare Allah to be free of imperfections and the hamd is to praise him for his names and attributes and actions. So it joins between declaring Allah to be free of imperfection and praising his perfection, both of them together. And he went, Tasbih and hamd come together, that's the meaning. Otherwise, tasbih by itself can include that. That's the dalil. Here, the tasbih is that Allah is al a'la. So the tasbih includes praising Allah for being the most high. However, when the two of them come together, tasbih is to deny all of the four, like misconceptions or faults or flaws, and the hamd is to praise Allah for his names and attributes and actions. Mm. As do the angels praise Allah and declare him any to be free of imperfections out of fear of him. SubhanAllah, the angels fear Allah and yet they don't have any sin. 
They do what they're told. The angels don't have any sin. Like they have extreme fear of Allah. They have extreme fear of Allah. We're going to hear that the angels, when the revelation comes, and they, they collapse, or from them are those that collapse out of fear of Allah. Yet when we listen to the revelation, we take it so lightly. Yet there are angels that collapse from the fear of Allah when the revelation comes. And Allah Azza wa Jal sends us sawa'iq, the thunderbolts, and strikes whoever he wills. And while this is the case, any, at the time this is the case, yet, despite all of this, I quite like the translation of the clear Quran, yet, they dispute about Allah. They argue with you about Allah. When this is the, when the thunder praises Allah, when the angels praise Allah, when Allah sends the thunderbolts to strike whoever he wills, and they are arguing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tremendous in might. لَهُ دَعْوَةُ الْحَقِّ وَالَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِهِ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُونَ لَهُمْ بِشَيْءٍ إِلَّا كَبَاسِطِ كَفَّيْهِ إِلَى الْمَاءِ لِيَبَلُغَ فَاهُ وَمَا هُوَ بِبَالِغِهِ وَمَا دُعَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ To him alone is a supplication of truth, and those they call upon besides him do not respond to them with a thing, except as one who stretches his hands towards water from afar, calling it to reach his mouth, but it will not reach it. Thus, from afar, from afar, sorry. Oh. As one who stretches his hand. Um, as, one, as one who stretches his hands towards water from afar, calling it to reach his mouth, but it will not reach it. Thus, and supplication of the disbelievers is not by an error. The supplication of truth, da'watul haqq, is the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal alone and making dua to Him alone. And that's the meaning of it. Ibadatuhu wahtahu la sharika lah wa ikhlas yani ad-dua lahu subhanahu wa ta'ala yani calling to the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal that he is alone, one with no partner, and making dua to him alone. And all those that they make dua to, again the word dua comes here, do not respond to them with a thing. Their example is like the one who stretches out his hands to reach water, so that the water will come, and he, the water is out of his reach, and he puts out his hands, to reach the water as though the water will jump into his mouth and it is as though it will come out and flow into his mouth but never will it reach his mouth and that is the example of the one who calls makes dua to other than Allah Azza wa he's raising his hands to one that will never accept him the same as the person who went to the shore of a lake and raised his hands for the water to come from the lake into his mouth Never ever will it reach him. How long he stands there with his hands out for the water to come, never will it come. Never will it reach him. And the, yani, the supplication of the disbelievers is wasted because they call upon other than Allah. They make dua to other than Allah. For this ayah is a profound Ayah in calling upon Allah Azza wa Jal alone and that dua to anyone other than Allah is batil, is falsehood. وَلِلَّهِ يَسْجُدُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا وَظِلَالُهُمْ بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْآصَالِ And to Allah prostrates whoever is within the heavens and the earth willingly or by compulsion and their shadows in the morning as well in the mornings and the afternoons what is the meaning of taw'an wa karhan in he willingly or unwillingly willingly like the sujood of the believers 
when they make sujood to Allah, any out of choice, they choose to make sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as for uh, al kar any the one who refuses to worship his Lord, and he refuses to worship his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he cannot escape the fact that he is under Allah's control. And likewise, the sujood of the shadow in the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Every one of them, their sujood is according to their situation. And this is an important point here because people can struggle to understand the ayah. They can say, okay, I can understand how the believer makes sujood, but I can't understand how does the shadow make sujood? How does the sun make sujood? How do the trees make sujood? Each one of them according to their nature. And each one of them according to their nature, and according to what is suited for them. And for example, the sun setting and rising can be a kind of yani, sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is befitting to the sun in the morning and the evening. And how strange is it that people make sujood to the sun? when the sun makes sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not every one of them makes sujood like us. Not all of them put their hands and knees and faces on the ground because that's what suits our creation. And we have hands and we have faces and we have knees. So we put them on the ground. Like in each one of them has a sujood that is suited to their creation. And this is an ayah of sujood. at tilawa it's the second one that we have in the Quran out of 15. We, it's the only second one we came to so far, right? We had Surah Al-Araf and now we have Surah Al-Ra'd. قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ قُلِ اللَّهِ قُلْ أَفَتَّقَذْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ نَفْعًا وَلَا ضَرًّا قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرُ أَمْ هَلْ تَسْتَوِي الظُّلُمَاتُ وَالنُّورُ أَمْ جَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَكَاءَ خَلَقُوا كَخَلْقِهِ فَتَشَابَهَ الْخَلْقُ عَلَيْهِمْ قُلِ اللَّهُ خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ الْوَاحِدُ الْقَهَّارِ سَيْءٍ who is your Lord of the heavens and the earth? Say Allah. Say, have you then taken besides him allies not possessing even for themselves any benefit or any harm? Say, is the blind equivalent to the seeing? Or is darkness equivalent to light? Or have they attributed to Allah partners? Attributed. Yeah. Have they attributed to Allah partners who created like his creation so that the creation of each seemed similar to them? Say, Allah is the creator of all things and he is the one of the prevailing. This doesn't mean that they believed in a creator besides Allah. This means that they didn't. I mean, the ayah brings here, and people misunderstand the ayah, that it means that they believed in a creator besides Allah. The ayah means they didn't. Allah is bringing a proof against them. Do you actually believe your idols created the heavens and the earth and you can't tell the difference between what your idol created and what Allah created? Rather, you know that Allah is the creator of everything. And that's why in man samawati wal ard, Allah. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say Allah. So the ayah is using this as a proof against them. The ayah is not a proof they believed in creators besides Allah. The ayah is using against them. Do you actually believe your idol created the earth? Or do you have a confusion over what your idol created and what Allah created? Rather, you don't. You believe that only Allah is the creator. And therefore, how can you take others as awliya besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Anzala minas samai ma'an fasalat awdiyatun biqadriha fahtamala sayl zabadar rabiyah 
ومما يوقدون عليه في النار ابتغاء حلية أو متاع زبد مثله كذلك يضرب الله الحق والباطل فأما الزبد فيذهب جفاء وأما ما ينفع الناس فيمكث في الأرض كذلك يضرب الله الأمثال. He sends down from the sky rain and valleys flow according to their capacity and the torrent carries a, raise, a rising foam and from that all which they heat in the fire desiring adornments and utensils is a form like it. Thus Allah pre presents the example of truth and falsehood. As for the form, it vanishes, being cast off. But as for that which benefits the people, it remains on the earth. Thus does Allah present examples. This example or parable is from the great parables of the Qur'an. And it's very easy to understand. Allah Azza wa Jal sends down rain from the sky and the valleys fill up with water. I don't know if you've, for those of you who live in the Middle East, you understand this example. Uh, that the valleys are dry. Even here in the UK, when you come in the summer, the streams and so on are dry. There's only a tiny little bit of water in. But what you don't maybe understand is that when you talk about the valleys of the Middle East, when the rain comes, it comes in big amounts. And the valley fills up a torrent of water. What is carried on top of that water? I want you to picture that water now. Picture a dry valley that the rain has come down in floods, how do you picture the top of that water? It's carrying all kinds of dirt and foam. Yani from the, the valley, from the sides of the valley, it's carrying all kinds of like foam and dirt on it. It's not a crystal clear, beautiful, pure water. It's carrying foam and dirt. Likewise, when you make tools or jewelry in fire, there's a slag, they call it slag, I believe. That's the translation in the clear Quran, and I think it's the best one. There's a slag, like a foam, which comes off of the, the fire. When they form in the blacksmith's furnace, when they hammer tools, swords, and you know utensils, what happens? There becomes like a foam, like a slag, like a dirt on top of the fire. So the fire, the molten fire is there, and on top of it, there is like a, like a dirt, or a slag that is cast off from the metal. What remains? What do people benefit from? Do people benefit from the slag and the foam? Or do people benefit from the tool that came out of the fire? Or they benefit from the water that was delivered by the valley? The people don't benefit from the dirt that is carried on top. Allah gives this example of the truth and the falsehood. As for the falsehood, it will be cast away the same way that that foam is cast away. What does the blacksmith do? He takes that slag on top of the molten any substance and he just brushes it off. Or there's a little hole in the furnace which drains it off. Nobody keeps it. What happens with the foam of the valley? People dip into the valley, take the water, and they brush the foam off the top, they brush the dirt off the top, they pour it off the top. That's the truth and the falsehood. The truth is what will remain. The truth is what people will benefit from. What is sincere for Allah will stay on this earth. As for a zabad, that which is the foam and the slag, it just disappears, people throw it away. And that is, the, the, that is the example of sincerity for Allah and that which is not done sincerely for Allah. And that's why you might see someone do so much in terms of actions, but nothing actually remains for the people. And you might see somebody do something which is very, very simple, yet it remains among the people and benefits the people. Because this is Allah's sunnah. That what is sincere for him and what is true and what is right, it will stay and remain the people for the people. It will just disappear. Let me give you an example of that in da'wah. 
the da'wah of the firaq al-dalla and the da'wah of Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnah, since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and their da'wah remains and the people continue to benefit from it, book after book, scholar after scholar, until today, people benefit from it. As for Ahlul Bid'ah, they go through phases, right? So they start in one thing and then they leave it. And then they go to another phase and then they leave it. And then they go to another one and they leave it. And the people don't take from the first. Yani this first phase is nothing to do with us. We don't take from them. And they declare each other to be kuffar. And all of that. Because what is not done for Allah, what is not done in the right way, the batil, and it's just going to disappear. Who remembers? People don't even remember it. Yani. The books are cast away and new books are written. The madhab is thrown away and a new madhab is brought instead of it. And the views that they had before are thrown away and a new view is taken instead. As for what benefits the people, it remains on the earth. This is the sunnah of Allah. And what is done sincerely for Allah, what benefits the people remains upon the earth. And people benefit from it, people Yani continue to benefit from it the way that they benefit from the tools that they make in the fire, the way that they benefit from the water that is carried by the valley. But nobody keeps the dirt on top. They throw it away. Uh, just a moment. Now, Amin Sa'di mentions that the example of the da'wah of the prophets and the da'wah to Allah versus the shubuhat and shahawat, the desires and the confusion. So the desires and confusion, people throw it away. And it's a temporary thing. It doesn't last. It doesn't benefit the people. One doubt goes away. Another one comes. One desire comes. People get rid of it. But what stays? is what is sincerely for Allah and in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam any the guidance that Allah Azza wa Jal sent down is what stays and that which is in accordance with it is that which stays for those who have responded to their Lord is the best reward for those who did not respond to him if they had all that is in the earth entirely and the like of it with it they would attempt to ransom themselves thereby those will have the worst account and their refuge is hell and wretched is the resting place and they'll have a terrible reckoning. A terrible reckoning, a terrible account. Even if they had whatever was in the earth, and the likes of it again, you need double what is in the earth to spend, it would never be accepted from them. Then is he who knows that what has been revealed to you from your Lord is the truth like one who is blind? They will only be reminded who are people of understanding. Any blind to the truth now. الذين يوفون بأحد الله ولا ينقضون الميثاق. Those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and do not break the contract. So Allah is the in these ayat describes the situation of the believer and the situation of the disbeliever. So the first thing that he mentions regarding the believer is those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and they do not break the covenant. 
and the covenant is a comprehensive word. Al-Ahd, Al-Mithaq, and uh, Al-Aqd, Al-Uqud. All of these are comprehensive words for everything that you have been commanded to do and you have taken on board every responsibility that you have between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they don't break that treaty. They don't break that covenant between them and Allah. That's the first description of them. And that's similar to what we've heard, by the way. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, awfu bil uqud, or you who believe, fulfill your covenant. And many, many times we've spoken yani, already about fulfilling the covenant of Allah. Naam. وَالَّذِينَ يَصِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلَ وَيَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ وَيَخَافُونَ سُوءَ الْحِسَابِ And those who join that which Allah has ordered to be joined and fear their Lord and afraid, are afraid of the evil of their account. Naam, so three descriptions are brought here for them. Those people who connect what Allah commanded them to and they maintain ties. Now that can be in everything. That's a very, very comprehensive term for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded to be joined. And we mentioned that in, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, yani not just the, the issue of relatives. Yani. Everything which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to keep ties with yani, or to connect yourself to it's a comprehensive term. It's not just about ties of kinship, but it includes ties of kinship as well. And they have khashia of their Lord. Khashia is fear which is accompanied by knowledge of the status of the one that you fear. It's not just fear. It's fear that is accompanied by knowledge. That's why Allah said, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء the only people who are really have khashia of Allah are the ulama, the scholars, because they understand who Allah is, and so they fear Allah Azza wa Jal with knowledge about Allah's greatness. Naam? And they fear an evil account. In Surah Al Hisab, we ask Allah to keep us safe from Surah Al Hisab. In Surah Al Hisab, like when the Prophet said, مَنْ نُوْقِشَ حِسَابُهُ هَلَكْ أَوْ كَمَا قَالْ Whoever their account is taken in detail will be destroyed. And so al hisab is from what angle? From us. And you brought evil in your life. You brought evil deeds. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you to account for them. This is so al hisab وَالَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا بَتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْفَقُوا وَأَنْفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَةً وَيَدْرَؤُونَ وَيَدْرَؤُونَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ السَّيِّئَةَ أُولَئِكَ لَهُمْ عُقُبَ الدَّارِ And those who are patient, seeking the face of their Lord, and establish prayer and spend from what we have provided for them secretly and publicly and prevent evil with good. Those will have the good consequences of this home. I'm going to read you what a Sa'di said about what Allah commanded you to join. He said, Allah commanded you. This is general for everything that Allah commanded you to join. Iman in him and his messengers. Loving him and loving his messengers. Submitting to worshipping him alone with no partner, obeying his messenger, keeping ties with your fathers and mothers and being good to them in statements and actions and not being bad to them, keeping ties with your relatives and the ties of the wombs and being good to them in what you say and what you do and keeping good ties between you and your spouses and yani, your companions and your slaves by giving them their rights completely in the religion and in this world. And I think, wallahi, that is a very powerful statement that he said. And it's better than the, 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 all of the three translations that are mentioned here, because they limited it only to the ties of kinship. Again, it, it covers how you treat your spouse, how you treat your companions, how you treat your slaves, how you 
yani even how you love Allah, your connection between Allah, the connection with you and the Messenger. As for the ayah, they had sabr. They had sabr with three types. Patience in doing good deeds, patience in keeping away from sin, and patience with regard to what Allah decreed from them in the painful and difficult decrees. And they did that because they want to see the face of Allah in Jannah. And they performed the salah and they spend out of what we provided for them secretly and openly. And they repel the evil they do with good. Meaning the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, follow up an evil deed with a good deed and it will wipe it out. They will have uqub ad-dar. Uqub ad-dar, they will have the ultimate abode, in the best end, in the, the, the place of safety in the end. Now, what Jen is the place of safety in the end? It's in this next ayah. Now. Jannatu adni yadkhulunaha wa man salaha min abaihim wa azwajihim wa dhurriyatihim wal malaikatu yadkhuluna alayhim min kulli bab Gardens of perpetual residence they will enter them with whoever were righteous among their forefathers their spouses and their descendants, and the angels will enter upon them from every gate, saying, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum fa ni'ma Peace be upon you for what you patiently endured, and excellent is the final home. In the final home, uh, the clear Quran says the ultimate abode. I quite like that, the ultimate abode. It's quite good. Uqub ad-dar, any the final, ultimate place that you will dwell. Yeah. And what did they get it for? They got it for their sabr. What was it that got them Jannah to Adan? Gardens of perpetual residence. What did they get from it? Any along with their fathers, their spouses, their children, the angels giving salam to them. What did they get it for? Salamun alaykum bima sabartu. Salam upon you because of the sabr that you had. Sabr ala ta'atillah wa sabr an ma'asiyatillah wa sabr ala aqtarillahi al mu'lima. Sabr in doing good, sabr in keeping away from bad, and sabr upon Allah's difficult decrees that He decrees for you. And when they had this sabr, the angels said to them, Salamun alaykum bima sabr. This that you got in Jannah, you got it because of your sabr. Fani'ma uqub ad-dar. Wal-ladheena yanqudoona ahda Allahi min ba'di mithaqihi wa yaqta'oon wa yaqta'oon ma amara Allahu bihi an yusala wa yufsidoona fi al-ardi ulaik but those who break the covenant of Allah after contracting it and se se and sever 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 that which Allah has ordered to be joined and spread corruption on earth for them is the curse and they will have the worst home. Look at the contrast. What do they do? They break the promise of Allah after they made it. All the promises they made to Allah in all the types. They sever the ties they were commanded to keep with Allah, with the Rasul, with their relatives, with their spouses, with their children. They cause corruption on the earth. These people will be cast far away from Allah's mercy and they will have the worst abode, the, the worst home. Allah يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَقْدِرُ وَفَرِحُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا مَتَاعِ 
Allah extends provision for whom He wills and restricts it. And they rejoice in the worldly life, while the worldly life is not compared to the hereafter, except brief enjoyment. You know, they take the provision of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. They take this provision and what they do is they believe that this provision shows that Allah loves them. But this dunya, Allah gives it. لِمَنْ أَحَبْ وَلِمَنْ لَا يُحِبْ Allah gives this dunya to the one that he loves and he gives this dunya to the one that he doesn't love at all. And yet they take this dunya as a sign that Allah loves them. When this dunya is a temporary enjoyment. In reality, if you look at this dunya, how long does the average person live? Between 60 to 70 years from this ummah. And few of them will be older than that. The Prophet ﷺ said, few will go beyond that from my ummah. 60 to 70 years and few will go beyond that. How is that in compar comparison to everlasting life in the hereafter? وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَةٌ مِّن رَبِّهِ قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ أَنَابٍ and those who disbelieved say, Why has not a sign been sent down to him from his Lord? Say, O Muhammad, indeed Allah leaves astray whom he wills and guides to himself whoever turns back to him. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطَمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ I'll add one more time, be careful with the ta. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطَمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطَمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Those who have believed and whose hearts are assured by the remembrance of Allah Unquestionably, by the remembrance of Allah, hearts are assured. And what brings Tuma'anina to the heart? What brings to the heart yani, that you feel rested, you feel tranquil, you feel happy, you feel at peace? What brings to your heart peace is the dhikr of Allah, Azza wa Jal. And the greatest of the dhikr of Allah is the Qur'an. The Qur'an is what brings peace to your heart. And what settles your heart. And that's why whenever you feel stressed or you feel down or you feel like you're struggling, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah bi dhikri lahi tautuma innu al-qulub. Al-lazina amanu wa aminu al-salihati tuba lahum wa husnu ma'ab. Those who have believed and done righteous deeds, a good state is theirs and a good return. Now. <laughs> لِتَتْلُوَ عَلَيْهِمُ الَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَانِ قُلْ هُوَ رَبِّي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَإِلَيْهِ مَتَابَ Thus have we sent you to a community before which other communities have passed on so you might recite to them that which we reveal to you while they disbelieve in the most merciful say he is my Lord there is no deity except him. Upon him I rely and to him is my return. In my return in, in repentance. In matab, mm. in here is my return in repentance. وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَانِ They deny Ar-Rahman. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ When it's said to them, اُسْجُدُوا لِلرَّحْمَانِ قَالُوا وَمَا الرَّحْمَانِ 
make sajda to Ar-Rahman, they say, who is Ar-Rahman? They disbelieve in Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. Look at the contradiction. They disbelieve in the most merciful, the one who has the most mercy, infinite and perfect mercy, that does not resemble the mercy of his creation. It's far greater than that. Perfect mercy, and yet they disbelieve in him. وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَانِ وَلَوْ أَنَّ قُرْآنًا سُيِّرَتْ بِهِ الْجِبَالُ أَوْ قُطِّعَتْ بِهِ الْأَرْضُ أَوْ كُلِّمَ بِهِ الْمَوْتَى بَلِ لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ جَمِيعًا أَفَلَمْ يَيْأَسِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَلَّوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ لَهَدَى النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا ولا يزال الذين كفروا تصيبهم بما صنعوا قارعة قارعة أو تحل قريبا من دارهم حتى يأتي وعد الله إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد and if there was any Qur'an by which the mountains would be removed or the earth would be broken apart or the dead would be made to speak, <coughs> it would be this Qur'an. But to Allah belongs this, the, the affair entirely. Then have those who believed not accepted that had Allah willed, He would have guided the people, all of them. And those who disbelieve do not cease to be struck for what they have done by calamity or it will descend near their home. Until there comes the promise of Allah. Indeed, Allah does not fall, fail in His promise. And it seems as though the disbelievers asked for these things. And Allah Azawajal says that this Quran, this Quran, if it were, if there were something that would make the dead speak and make the mountains turn to dust and break the earth into pieces, it would be this Quran. For ex understanding the status of the Quran. And sometimes people say, for example, we said when they treat people with ruqya, they say, oh, you know, why are you treating people with qul huwa Allahu ahad? Why are you reading, reading qul huwa Allahu ahad? And qul a'udhu bi rabbil fala, qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. This is sihr azim. For wallahi, this person doesn't know the status of the Quran. And the person who says, why are you reading on the people qul a'udhu bi rabbil fala, qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas? Is that all you have? This is a Qur'an, if it was sent down upon the mountains, it would turn it to dust. And if it was sent down upon the earth, it would break it apart. And if it was sent down upon the dead, it would make them to speak. This Qur'an, you cannot put into words the status of this Qur'an except how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it. So don't belittle the Qur'an and its value. Now, that's the first thing. Rather, Allah Azawajal willed that it was not sent down upon those things. Allah Azawajal willed that the Qur'an was sent down to mankind and that mankind take benefit and guidance from it. And if Allah willed, He would have guided every single person. And we spoke about this. This is from Allah's justice and wisdom. And the disbelievers are struck by what they, are, what they have done. There. Some torments, some punishments, some hardships come to them because of what they have done. Either it strikes them directly or it strikes nearby their homes until either they will accept Islam or the punishment and the promise of Allah Azza wa Jal that they have been promised in terms of the punishment will come to them and Allah does not fail in His promise. وَلَقَدْ اسْتُهْزِئَ بِرُسُولٍ مِّن قَبَلِكَ فَأَمْلَيْتُ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثُمَّ أَخَذْتُهُمْ فَكَيْفَ كَانَ عِقَابٍ And already were other messengers ridiculed before you, and I extended the time of those who disbelieved. Then I seized them, and how terrible was my penalty. And this is the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal and the promise of Allah. And they're given a certain amount of time, and when their time comes, the punishment of Allah seizes them suddenly. And how terrible the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal is. أَفَمَنْ هُوَ قَائِمٌ عَلَى كُلِّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَكَاءَ قُلْ سَمُّوهُمْ 
أم تنبئونه بما لا يعلم في الأرض أم بظاهر من القول بل زين للذين كفروا مكرهم وصدوا عن Um, I also But, made that last night in the Taraweeh, made that mistake, wasuddu. And here, the, it's not that they misguided others, that saddu, suddu, they themselves were held back. Bal zuyyina lilladhina kafaru makruhum wasuddu anis sabeel wa man yudlilillahu fama lahu min had. Then, Is he who is a maintainer of every soul knowing what it has earned, like any other? But to Allah they have attributed partners. Say, name them. Or do you inform him of that which he knows not upon the earth or of what is apparent of speech? Rather, their own plan has been made attractive to those who disbelieve and they have been averted from the way and whomever Allah sends astray, there will be for him no guide. And he is the one who maintains every soul. This is yani, from the, Allah's name, Al-Qayyum. The one who maintains every single thing within creation. Knowing what it's earned. Like your gods that you associate with him. Say, name them. Tell us which god is like Allah who maintains every soul. Or do you inform Allah of that which he knows not upon the earth? Yani, do you tell that Allah did not know that he has partners? Or do you tell Allah what you allege in your speech? In this, what you allege in terms of you, you claim from these partners that you, that you claim that are, they are partners of Allah. Rather, your own plan, any or the, the disbelievers, their plan has been made attractive to them, and they have been diverted by Allah. Allah has diverted them from the right path. We said misguidance is in the hands of Allah out of wisdom and justice. And whoever sends, whoever Allah sends astray, there will be no guide. Still, and if, if, you, if you look at it, if you look at the clear Quran, they, it still they, they have this issue with misguidance. Whoever Allah leaves to stray. And that's not what Allah said. It's not even close to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, whoever Allah sends astray, he doesn't leave them astray, he sends them astray, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hikmatan minhu adla, out of wisdom and justice. In one of the meanings um, in the statement here, uh, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, am bi zahirin min al qawl, and in the clear Quran says, are these gods just empty words? That's a good translation. In a meaning that are you telling Allah that there are deities on the earth that he doesn't know about? Or are you just saying empty words? Or are you just saying empty words? This is a better translation. Yeah. Also, Muhsin Khan is very similar to that. Muhsin Khan, are you informing him of something he knows not in the earth? Or is it just a show of false words? That's a better, better tafsir. And are you just, are you telling that Allah does not know that he has partners? Or are you just making up names? Do they know that they are only making up names? Lahum adabu fil hayati dunya wal adabu al akhirati ashaq wa ma lahum min allahi min waq For them will be punishment in the life of this world and the punishment of the hereafter is more severe and they will not have from Allah any protector. In Iwaq here, if you think about the word taqwa, yani this is the same idea. Waq, yani something that will shield you. There will be nothing besides Allah to shield you from his punishment. مَثَلُ الْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي وُعِدَ الْمُتَّقُونَ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ أُكُلُهَا دَائِمٌ وَظِلُّهَا تِلْكَ عُقُبَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا وَعُقُبَ الْكَافِرِينَ النَّارِ The example 
of paradise, which the righteous have been promised, is that beneath it rivers flow, its fruit is lasting, and its shade, that is the consequence for the righteous, and the consequence for the disbelievers is the fire. I like the word outcome. Outcome is better. Ultimate outcome in the clear Quran is better. <laughs> وَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَفْرَحُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمِنَ الْأَحْزَابِ مَنْ يُنْكِرُ بَعْضَهُ قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ وَلَا أُشْرِكَ بِهِ إِلَيْهِ أَدْعُوْ وَإِلَيْهِ مَآبٍ And the believers among those to whom we have given the previous Scripture, rejoice at what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad. But among the opposing factions are those who deny part of it. Say, I only have be, I have only been commanded to worship Allah and not associate anything with Him. To Him I invite, and to Him is my return. Just one moment. Any min tawa'if al kuffar. That's what it means. Min al ahzab. Min tawa'if al kuffar, the different groups of kuffar, different ones of them have different issues. And each group of them has their own things that they have an issue with. And the mushrikeen has he made all of our gods into one god. Does Ahlul Kitab have the same issue? No, their issue is to do with either the Trinity or to do with uh, any the issue of uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. For each one of them has their own any problems or their own rejection of parts of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran. Now. And again, the Prophet clearly says that I was commanded to worship Allah alone and not to make any partner with him. To him I call and to him will be my return. وَكَذَلِكَ أَنزَلْنَاهُ حُكْمًا عَرَبِيًّا وَلَئِنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ بَعْدَ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ مَا لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا وَاقُ And thus we have revealed it as an Arabic legislation. And if you should follow their inclinations after what has come to you of knowledge, you will not have against Allah any ally or any protector. Yeah. In the Prophet is always told not to follow the desires and the inclination of those who disbelieve. And as for the Quran being an Arabic legislation, it contains the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we already spoke about the beginning of Surah Yusuf. Inna anzalnahu Quranan Arabian. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلًا مِّن قَبَلِكَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَذُرِّيَّةً وَمَا كَانَ لِرَسُولٍ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ بِآيَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ لِكُلِّ أَجَلٍ كِتَابٍ And we have already sent messengers before you and assigned to them wives and descendants. And it was not for a messenger to come with a sign except by permission of Allah, for every term is a decree. From this is the proof that the prophets married, alayhim salatu wassalam. And that uh, marriage is from the sunnah of the prophets. Marriage and having children is from the sunnah of the prophets. It's not from the sunnah of the prophets to be celibate. And like some of the Christians claimed that the sunnah of the prophets is to be celibate. The sunnah of the prophets is to marry and have children. And no messenger can bring any sign without Allah's permission. يَمْحُوا اللَّهُ مَا يَشَّاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ Allah eliminates what He wills or confirms and with Him is the mother of the book. In Allah, Allah eliminates the qadr that He wills to eliminate and He establishes the qadr that He wishes. And from this is the proof that qadr can change. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes from his qadr whatever he wills and changes from his qadr whatever he wills, but that change will not go outside of the lawh al mahfuz. This is the answer. Yamhu Allahu ma yasha wa yuthbit wa indahu ummul kitab. 
yani the qadr that changes does not go outside of Ummul Kitab, what is in the Lawul Mahfuz. But the qadr is of different types. Yani there is the ultimate qadr, which is the Lawul Mahfuz, and there are the commands, the aqdar, which are given to the angels, for example. This is what will happen this year. This is what will happen to this person. This, if Allah Azza wa Jal wills to change it, the change is already written in the Lawul Mahfuz. وَإِمَّا نُرِيَنَّكَ بَعْضَ الَّذِينَ عِدُهُمْ أَوْ نَتَوَفَّيَنَّكَ فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغُ وَعَلَيْنَا الْحِسَابِ And whether we show you part of what we promised them or take you in death, upon you is only the duty of notification and upon us is the account. In the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi job is to convey the message and Allah will take the people to account for what they did with regard to it. Whether or not the Prophet ﷺ sees the destruction of his people, or whether he dies and does not see the destruction of his people, Allah will take those people to account. The Prophet ﷺ only has to deliver the message. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّا نَأْتِي الْأَرْضَ نَنْقُصُهَا مِنْ أَطْرَافِهَا والله يحكم لا معقب لحكمه وهو سريع الحساب. Have they not seen what we have? We have they not seen that we set upon the land, reducing it from its borders, and Allah decides there is no adjuster of His decision, and He He is swift in account. And here, the famous tafsir of the ayah is that Allah Azza wa Jal causes the, yani, the land of the mushrikeen to decrease by yani, the death of the on destruction of those who deny and by the conquest of the lands of the disbelievers, the taking of their wealth and so on. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, I'll read you what Al-Sa'di said Rahimahullah ta'ala He said Qila bi-ihlaki al-mukathibin Wa isti'asal al-zalimin Wa qila bi-fathi buldan al-mushrikin Wa naqsihim fi amwalihim wa abdanihim Wa qila ghayru thalika min al-aqwal He said there are different views From the views is that it happens by the destruction of the deniers. And it said it happens by the conquest of their lands. And it's and other views are there. He said, Wallahiru Wallahu Alam and Al Murada Bidalik, the clear yani, what seems to be the intended meaning. Anna Aradi Haula il Mukadibin Jaal Allahu Yftahuha Wishtahuha. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has begun to slowly and he, or has begun to uh, yani, for the Muslims to any decree for the Muslims to conquer their lands piece by piece. Meaning that what is happening to them is that they are slowly in decline. And they're declining. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decree for them destruction. No one will be able to repel it. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wallahu yahkumu la mu'aqib ali hukmi. Allah azza wa jal will judge, and he judge things to happen to those people. No one will be able to repel it. There's also a view, and if I can, I'll bring it to you inshaAllah ta'ala. I will highlight this page to bring you. There's a view that the ayah contains Yani the 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 death of the ulama, the death of the scholars. This is a view with regard to the ayah. Allahu Musta'an. Awalam yaraw. La, you read that one, sir. La, you read awalam yaraw. 
وقد مكر الذين من قبلهم فلله المكر جميعا يعلم ما تكسب كل نفس وسيعلم الكفار لمن عقب الدار And those before them had plotted but to Allah belongs the plan entirely He knows what every soul earns and the disbelievers will know for whom is the final home no. ويقول الذين كفروا ويقول الذين كفروا لست مرسلا قل كفى بالله شهيدا بيني وبينكم ومن عنده علم الكتاب and those who have disbelieved say you are not a mess you are not a messenger Say, O oh Muhammad, sufficient is Allah as witness between me and you and the witness of whoever has knowledge of the scripture. And they say you're not a messenger. Say Allah is sufficient as a witness. Allah is enough as a witness between me and you. Allah knows that I am a messenger and the Prophet ﷺ is told to say. Allah knows that I'm a messenger. I don't need the witness of anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, but likewise, the people of the scripture who accepted Islam, like Abdullah bin Salam and the other Jews and Christians who accepted Islam, they also bear witness to the truth of what I have brought. And Allah Azza wa bears witness to the truth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by his statements, actions, and approval. Yani Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Azza wa Jal supported the Prophet Sallallahu with victory. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yani the meaning of the Iqrar is that if Allah Azza wa Jal had yani the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal uh, if he had lied against us, we would have seized him. And we would have seized him. So the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was not seized with a punishment, this is the iqrar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, is, Allah bears witness through those things. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the witness of Ahl Kitab because these are a people who had the knowledge of the scripture before. And the Prophet ﷺ is not claiming a new religion. He's claiming a continuation of what has already been and what has already been revealed. And so the people who accepted Islam from Ahlul Kitab are suitable as a witness for the truth of that. That brings us to the end of Surah Al-Ra'd. We do have Surah Ibrahim. Uh, what I'm planning to do is let's just take a five minute breather. You can put the Mus'haf uh, on the screen so that everyone knows that we haven't uh, disappeared inshallah. Uh, because it's going to be a little bit of a long session. Surah Ibrahim is longer than Surah Al-Ra'd. And Surah Al-Ra'd took us an hour. So we have at least a good hour left. Maybe we can stop a little bit early and we can catch some of the Surah Ibrahim in the afternoon session. But it's difficult because every time we do that, we delay ourselves for the next time. So more likely than not, we'll just push through, uh, through it, inshallah. But uh, we need a little bit of a break. Uh, so let's take five minutes. Just put the mushaf on the screen, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, let's see. That should be us back on, inshallah ta'ala, after our little break. Uh, we don't normally take a break, but because the fact that we're still now, we still have seven pages of uh, Surah Ibrahim to go, and uh, that's going to take us, you know, at least an hour, if not longer. So we wanted to take a little bit of a break, inshallah ta'ala, just to stretch our legs and get everybody concentrating again and we can resume insha'Allah ta'ala with Surah Ibrahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alif Lam Ra Kitabun Anzalnahu ilayka litukhrijan nasa minal dhulumati ilan nuri bi'idhni rabbihim بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد 
Alif, Lam, Ra. This is a book which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, that you might bring mankind out of darkness into the light by permission of their Lord to the path of the exalted in might, the praiseworthy. The use of these two names, Al-Aziz Al-Hamid here, after mentioning the path that will lead to Allah, it indicates that yani, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone sufficient in might and power as a guide and a supporter for you on this path. Whatever difficulties you may face, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His might is sufficient. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of all praise. And He's worthy of praise for having guided you to that path and continuing to guide you to it. And He has praiseworthy names and attributes. Allah alladhi lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. وَوَيْلٌ لِلْكَافِرِينَ مِنْ عَذَابِ الشَّدِيدِ مِنْ عَذَابٍ وَوَيْلٌ وَوَيْلٌ لِلْكَافِرِينَ مِنْ عَذَابٍ It's green, it's green. مِنْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدٍ الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وَوَيْلٌ لِلْكَافِرِينَ مِنْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدٍ Allah to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth and woe to the disbelievers from a severe punishment. Al-wayl is either destruction or it is a valley in Jahannam. الَّذِينَ يَسْتَحِبُّونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا عَلَى الْآخِرَةِ وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَيَبْغُونَهَا عِوَجَا أُولَئِكَ فِي ضَلَالٍ بَعِيدٍ The ones who prefer the worldly life over the hereafter and avert people from the way of Allah, seeking to make it seem deviant. Those are in extreme error. No. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ فَيُضِلُّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And we do not send any messenger except speaking in the language of his people to state clearly for them. And Allah sends astray there by whom he wills and guides whom he wills. And he is the exalted in might, the wise. And from this is the evidence that every prophet spoke the language of his people. And this has a benefit in da'wah as well, that when giving da'wah, you should give da'wah in the language the people understand. Now, even within your language, there are different levels. And there is very academic uh, you can say very, a very high standard of English. There is, you know, the language of the street, the language of yani the, the people on the street. So where, how do you address that? The ayah is an evidence that you should speak to people in a way that they understand. However, you should speak to them in the best way that they can understand. And you don't use vulgar language. Don't use uh, inappropriate words but make sure that the goal is for people to understand what you're saying. That is why some of our mashayikh, Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Badr, Havidullah uh, Ta'ala told us that from his mashayikh were those people who gave the khutbah, khutbah al-Jum'ah in Arabic slang. <laughs> yeah, they did. That's not, that's not, that's not like, it doesn't, it's not strange, it's not unusual. Yani. Not in very like strong Arabic slang, but they were not frightened. And in these days, and in subhanAllah, sometimes the imams from their balagha and fasaha, the beauty of their language, like in the khutbah sounds like poetry. If you don't have a degree in Arabic, you cannot understand it. I'm not even saying that English, any Arabic students, I'm saying that Arabs don't understand it. And in the imam, if you listen to the khutbahs, for example, from the haramain, the balagha and the fasaha, and in the poetry and the language and the eloquence, I believe many Arabs don't understand what the Imam is saying. Very, yani, only they understand a part of what he's saying. 
But the Balagha, they, they don't understand what he's saying. It's very, very complicated, extremely hard to translate. Yes, it's beautiful, it's befitting to the masjid and everything, but ultimately the goal is for people to understand you. And that's why, yes, speak in an eloquent way, but speak in a way that people understand what you say. That's the most important thing. And that's why and it is praiseworthy that, and for example, an imam, no, he's not the imam of the masjid and Nabawi. He's the imam of a local masjid. And his people don't really understand that poetic Arabic. There's no need for him to take the khutbah from the masjid and Nabawi and start his poetic Arabic. Let him speak to the people the way they understand. Of course, with the most dignified and appropriate speech because it has to be suited to Islam, suited to the member of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it has to be suited to the Prophets. And you're going to stand on the member transmitting what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So there's no doubt that you have to use appropriate and uh, a, a reasonable standard of language. But there's nothing wrong with speaking in Amiya if it makes the people understand. And he had to even... Some of our mashayikh used to make inkar of us. Say, don't speak in Ammiya. Don't speak in Arabic dialect. Like the reality is, if that's what the people understand, when you go out to speak someone in the street, you want to talk to the guy in the shop and tell him, Akhi, don't sell these cigarettes. Wallah, it's not good for you. Fear Allah. And if you go to him with poetry and fasaha and balagha, he doesn't understand. Wallah, some of the taxi drivers, when I was talking to them, we'd be in the taxi. When I would say something, the taxi driver would laugh. I remember one time I said to him, we were talking about something, about Islam. And I said to him, something like, ha kada. It's like this. Yani, ha kada yakun. Like this it is. He just kept repeating it for the whole way in the taxi. Ha kada, ha kada. Ha yani he found it such a strange word, and yani he's never heard it before. But if I said to him, Kida, he would have understood straight away what I meant. And he would have understood straight away what I meant. So the end of the day, it is nice to have beautiful language. We're not taking away from beautiful language, and we're not taking away from the beauty of the khutbahs and the haramain and everything. They're very beautiful. But ultimately in da'wah, what matters is that your people understand what you say to them. And if they're not understanding, then the beauty of the language actually isn't benefiting you anything. And this also contains the benefit that the da'iyah, there is no harm in him giving da'wah in his own language. Sahih, the Arabic language is what binds us together as Muslims. But there's no harm in the da'iyah giving da'wah in English or in his own language so that his people can understand. Yeah. Once again, the clear Qur'an has this musiba with regard to misguidance. I don't know why, I and mean, I don't know what makes them reluctant to say Allah misguides. And they always, the, the whole translation, they avoid this topic. They say Allah sends astray, Allah allows people to, stay, to, to be astray, Allah permits them to be misguided. All of this is just avoiding the reality of what Allah said. Allah misguides. We should not be shy to say it. That's what Allah said. And that's the aqeed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jaba'ah. Yudillu man yasha hikmatan minhu wa adla out of wisdom and justice. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا أَنْ أَخْرِجَ قَوْمَكَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِكُلِّ صَبَّارٍ شَكُورٍ And we certainly sent Musa with our signs, saying, bring out your people from darkness into the light and remind them of the days of Allah. Indeed, in that are signs for everyone patient and grateful. The days of Allah, there's two views with regard to the tafsir. The days of favor or the days of punishment. The days of favor as in the days of when Allah favored Bani Israel. Or the days of punishment when Allah punished the previous nations. And he remind them of the days when Allah favored them and remind them of the days when Allah punished the previous nations.
وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ أَنْجَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ يَسُومُونَكُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ وَيُذَبِّحُونَ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَيُذَبِّحُونَ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ أَبْنَاءَ هي إز مد وَيُذَبِّحُونَ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَكُمْ وَفِي ذَلِكُمْ بَلَاءٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ عَظِيمٌ And recall, O children of Israel, when Musa said to his people, Remember the favor of Allah upon you when he saved you from the people of Fir'aun who were afflicting you with the worst torment and were slaughtering your newborn sons and keeping your females alive and in that was a great trial from your Lord. وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَئِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ This ayah is a fundamental principle as it re- relates to a shukr gratitude and that is the more grateful you are the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you and if you are ungrateful Allah's punishment is severe in kafara you you disbelieve any or you deny like in the word kafara here is ingratitude because it came opposite shukr. Shukr wa kufr. Shukr is gratitude and the kufr here is ingratitude. And the greatest ingratitude is disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a fundamental principle. It's a, a principle that you can apply in every area of your life. La in shakartum, if you are grateful, la azidannakum, I will certainly give you more. Wa la in kafartum, and if you are ungrateful, in عذابي لشديد My punishment is very severe Gratitude is by three things It is by confessing To the blessing in your heart Any confessing this blessing is from Allah in your heart And by thanking Allah Azza wa Jal And praising Him with the tongue And by acting in a way that is pleasing to Allah And using that blessing in a pleasing way With your limbs اعملوا آل داود شكرا Act or family of Dawood in gratitude So gratitude is about action As well as statements And what you believe in your heart For example If you are given uh, Let's say for example When you're let's Say we talk about the masjid We spoke about this in the khutbah You're given this masjid And yes يعني, Alhamdulillah and You're given a, a masjid It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala If you're grateful for that blessing and you realize that this blessing came from Allah and you praise Allah for this blessing and you use this masjid for what is good and you take care of it and look after it, then Allah promises He will give you more and He will give you a better location, more facilities, uh, yani more durus, more lessons. And Allah will give you more because you took care of it and you were grateful to Allah for it. But if you're ungrateful, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take that blessing away any time that He wants. And many times in the Qur'an, the stories come that illustrate this principle, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ Do I read the English? Did you not read the English? No. Afwa, nice. Did I just get it? Sorry, Abdurrahman. We've been I remember when your Lord proclaimed, if you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. But if you deny indeed, my punishment is severe. وَقَالَ مُوسَىٰ إِن تَكْفُرُوا أَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ And Musa said, if you should disbelieve, you and whoever is on the earth entirely, indeed, Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. And Allah doesn't need your worship now. Alam ya- he doesn't need your worship, but He deserves your worship. So distinguish between those two things. Allah does not need you to worship Him, but He deserves it. It's, it's right. It's what is right. It's what's deserving for His blessings that He's given you and 
For his names and attributes and his actions, he deserves you to worship him. For his lordship, he deserves you to worship him. But he doesn't need you to worship him. And he's free of all need and worthy of all praise. أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَبَأُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبَلِكُمْ قَوْمِ نُوحٍ وَعَادٍ وَثَمُودَ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّهِ جَاءَتْهُمْ عفوا أعيد لا يعلمهم لا يعلمهم إلا الله جاءتهم رسلهم بالبينات فردوا فردوا أيديهم في أفواههم وقالوا وقالوا إنا كفرنا بما أرسلتم به وإنا لفي شك مما تدعوننا إليه مريب Has there not reached you the news of those before you? The people of Nuh and Ad and Thamud and those after them? No one knows them but Allah. Their messengers brought them clear proofs, but they returned their hands to their mouths and said, Indeed, we disbelieve in that which, which we, you have been sent. And indeed, we are about that to which you invite us in disquieting about doubt. Disquieting. Disquiet. I think disquieting. 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 disquieting doubt. Any the news who came before, any who came before the people of Bani Israel, from Nuh, the people of Nuh, the people of Ad, the people of Thamud, and those after them. There's two options for the for the uh, there's two options for the reading. You can read it like you read it there, Abdurrahman, where you read it. قوم نوح وعاد وثمود والذين من بعدهم, and you stopped. لا يعلمهم إلا الله and no one knows all of these people except Allah or you can read it قوم نوح وعاد وثمود والذين من بعدهم لا يعلمهم إلا الله and those who came after them no one knows except Allah meaning Allah has not told us about all of the nations who came after يعني نوح and عاد and ثمود or only Allah knows the reality of those people Any, and their stories and the details of them from the people of Nuh and Ad and Thamud and those who came after. As for them putting their hands over their mouths or their hands in their mouths, there's some different views about it. Any one of the views is that in rage, they bit on their hands. On the day when the oppressive person will bite on their hands and they bit their fingers in rage at what the prophets came with. Or from the views is they put their hands over their mouths to mock and he making a mockery of what the prophets brought. And one of the views is they put their hands over the mouths of the prophets and they block them from speaking. These are, the clear Quran mentions this is in, in a footnote. Um, and uh, Sahih International also brings it in a footnote uh, similar to that. And Ibn Kathir preferred it was a gesture of denial and rejection. Yani, they sh it's a gesture that they deny what the prophets believe in. And they put their fingers, their hands in their mouths as a gesture of denial. We don't accept what you brought. And that's what the ayah explains. They said, we disbelieved in what you've been sent with and we are in doubt over what you have, in, over what you're inviting us to. And you're in a state of Grave doubt. I think grave doubt makes more sense than um, alarming doubt is, is the one by the clear Quran. Muhsin Khan says grave doubt. Grave doubt to me seems to make sense because a shek or raib come together in, in this one. Uh, shek and then the word murib. Both a shek or raib. They come together. So the two of them come together to mean grave doubt. قالت رسلهم أفي الله شك فاطر السماوات والأرض يدعوكم ليغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويؤخركم إلى أجل مسمى 
قالوا إن أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا تريدون أن تصدون تريدون أن تصدون عما كان يعبد آباؤنا فأتونا بسلطان مبين. The messenger said, Can there be doubt about Allah, Creator of the heavens and earth? He invites you that He may forgive you or your of your sins. And he delays you for a specified term. They said, you are not but men like us who wish to avert us from what our fathers were worshipping. So bring us a clear authority. Afillahi shak. Is there any doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And they said this to rebuke them. Afillahi shak. Do you have, is there any doubt about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any, about who he is, about what he does, about what he has sent? Afillahi shak, meaning there is no doubt in it at all. As for them asking for a sultan, it's a clear authority and it means a proof. Any a clear proof of what you say. Qalat lahum rusuluhum innahnu illa basharum mithlukum walakin Allah وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَمُنُّ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ وَمَا كَانَ لَنَا أَنْ نَأْتِيَكُمْ بِسُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The messenger said to them, We are only men like you, but Allah com- comfort, confers. 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 But Allah confers favor upon whom he wills of his servants. It has never been for us to bring you evidence except by permission of Allah and upon Allah let the believers rely. Notice how did the and he notice how did the uh, messengers respond to it being said to them that you are only human beings. How did they respond to that? They said yes, we are human beings. How do we respond? Any, they said, yes, we are human beings. They didn't say, no, we are angels, no, we are different. They, they agreed with them. They said, yes, we are human beings. Except that Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen us and given us this grace of prophethood. And we can't bring you this sultan you ask for, this authority or this evidence you ask for without Allah's permission. We don't have the ability to bring things from our own will. وَمَا لَنَا أَلَّا نَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَقَدْ هَدَانَا سُبُولَنَا وَلَنَصْبِرَنَّ عَلَى مَا آذَيْتُمُونَا وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ and why should we not rely upon Allah while He has guided us to our good ways? And we will surely be patient against whatever harm you should cause us. And upon Allah, let those who would rely indeed rely. And why, why, why should we not rely upon Allah? What, what would prevent us relying on Allah when Allah is the one who guided us to the way that we are following now? And we will surely be patient and that shows that in da'wah, you need to be patient with what the harm that comes to you. What is the other here? It's hurtful words to begin with. And it was worse than that later on. But for, for the first the first thing the people brought against the prophets, alayhim salatu wasalam, was hurtful words. al other was hurtful words. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِرُسُولِهِمْ لَنُخْرِجَنَّكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِنَا أَوْ لَتَعُودُنَّ فِي مِلَّتِنَا فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ لَنُهْلِكَنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ And those who disbelieved said to their messengers, We will surely drive you out of your, our land. Or you must return to our religion, so their Lord inspired to them, we will surely destroy the wrongdoers. وَلَنُسْكِنَنَّكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ 
ذلك لمن خاف مقامي وخاف وعيد I will surely cause you to dwell in the land after them that is for he who fears my position, position and fears my threat. I like Sahih International did a very good job here of bringing the two tafsirs of the word maqami. And here that Allah Azza wa Jal, his sunnah is, because here it's, it's general, right? It's talking about the messengers. And so the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal, with regard to the messengers is after he has saved the believing people, he will give them a chance to have authority on the earth. This is for the one who fears my position. The maqam, there is two views about it. One view is that the maqam means al-qiyam bayna yadaillah, standing in front of Allah. And that is the translation of the clear Qur'an and also Muhsin Khan, fear standing before me. But also the maqam, it means to fear Allah's positions, Allah's status. You need to fear Allah's names and attributes and actions. For both of those are true. Yani they fear Allah because of his names and attributes and actions, and they fear standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they fear the threat of punishment. And they request a decision and disappointed, therefore, was every obstinate tyrant. And he appears here. Uh, the clear Quran is that is the idea that both of them asked, and he both of them asked for judgment. The believers and the messengers said, and he, "Oh Allah, separate us from our people." And those people, they said, "Bring upon us the judgment. Bring upon us the punishment." They sought victory and help from from their Lord, who was disappointed, who was brought to ruin. The obstinate ones. Uh, whether it's both of them or whether it's only the prophets and messengers, any both is possible. Like in the 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 idea here is that the prophets and messengers sought Allah's help and aid to separate between them and their people. And what was the end result? The destruction and the loss and doom of every obstinate tyrant. Before him is hell and he will be given a drink of purulent water. I think, pur, pur, I don't know, pur, purulent, I would have thought it is. Purulent. But it means festering and oozing pus. <clears throat> and he will, they will drink the... <clears throat> The pus that comes out from the wounds of the people of hell. And when the people of hell, their wounds, يعني, the, the filth that comes out of the wound, that is what they will be given to drink. <laughs> He will gulp it but will hardly be able to swallow it and death will come to him from everywhere but he is not to die and before him is a massive punishment. And here, gulp it, I think sip it with sip it with difficulty is the best translation here. He will sip it unwillingly. Mohsin Khan is what is very good. And he will sip it unwillingly and he will not be able to swallow it. And he, could you imagine, and he almost, could you imagine being given a glass of the blood and the pus from someone's wound? And he will sip, but he will almost not be able to swallow it. Death will come to him from every place, but he will never die. And that is and in, from the most profound of the ayat in describing the punishment. Death will come to him and as if everything that he's doing should cause him to die. The burning fire should cause him to die. Being beaten and in, by the angels would cause him to die. 
the boiling water that he drinks would cause him to die. Zakum would cause him to die. Everything, remember they will put this horrible, and imagine this, they put this pus into their mouth or they put the tree of Zakum which rips out their stomachs from the inside. And then at that point when their stomachs are ripped out, they cry for water. What does Allah give them? Allah gives them boiling water which scalds their throat. Their skins burn off, but then they're replaced with new skins. But never will he die. And for him is a an even worse punishment beyond that. And that is because the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal, it does not lighten for these people ever. And the punishment becomes worse and worse. What did Allah Azza wa Jal say in Surah Surah uh, in Surah Naba and Naba? فَذُوقُوا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا Taste the pain because we're just going to make it worse and worse for you every time. And we're only going to increase you in punishment day by day. أعمالهم كرماد اشتدت به الريح في يوم عاصف لا يقدرون مما كسبوا على شيء ذلك هو الضلال البعيد The example of those who disbelieve in their Lord is that their deeds are like ashes which the wind blows forcefully on a stormy day They are unable to keep from what they earned a single thing that is what is extreme error. Mm. Now, if you look at the example here, the example is if you had ashes, like the leftover ashes of a fire, soot, and you placed it on the stormy day, not on a day when there's a little bit of wind, on a day when there is a storm, and the ashes blow away from you, can you catch any of them back? Can you bring even one single piece of ash and bring it back? <clears throat> You cannot. So this is the example of the actions of the people who disbelieve. Haba and Manthura, scattered dust, ashes that are carried away by a violent wind. They cannot bring a single one of them back to them to benefit from it. Alam tara anna Allah khalaq as-samawati wal-arda bil-haq in yasha' yudhibakum wa ya'ti bi khalqin jadeed have you not seen that allah created the heavens and the earth in truth if he wills he can do away with you and produce a new creation in in truth yani for a true purpose and reason and wisdom that is with him subhanahu wa ta'ala and we've already spoken that if allah azza wa jalla wills he can take away with you and bring a new people وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ And that is not difficult for Allah. وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا فَقَالَ الضُّعَفَاءُ لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا إِنَّا كُنَّا لَكُمْ تَبَعًا فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُغْنُونَ عَنَّا مِنْ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ قالوا لو هدانا الله لهديناكم سواء علينا سواء علينا اجزعنا ام صبرنا ما لنا من محيص and they will come out for for judgment before Allah altogether and the weak will say to those who are arrogant indeed we were your followers so can you avail us anything against the punishment of Allah? They will say, if Allah had guided us, we would have guided you. It is all the same for us, whether we show intolerance or are patient. There is for us no place of escape. It's profound what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. It's the same for us, whether we are impatient or patient. If we scream at the top of our voices and we, and we have every kind of and we show every kind of distress, it will not lighten our punishment. 
And if we are patient, like somebody is, is hurting you and you try to hold it inside, it will not make any difference. There will be no escape. And the people who followed the wrongdoers and the idols and so on, and those people, their idols will not benefit them anything. Even those who worshipped, yani, and those who worship the righteous or the salihin, those righteous people will not avail them anything either. And in no one, they will not find the people that they followed benefit them at all. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعْدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ ما أنا بمصرخكم وما أنتم بمصرخي إني كفرت بما أشركتموني من قبل إن الظالمين لهم عذاب أليم And shaytan will say when the matter has been concluded indeed Allah has promised you the promise of truth and I promised you but I betrayed you but I had no authority over you except I invited you and you responded to me. So do not blame me, but blame yourselves. I cannot be called to your aid, nor can you be called to my aid. Indeed, I deny your association of me with Allah before. Indeed, for the wrongdoers is a painful punishment. This ayah tells us the outcome of everything with regard to the shaitan. Now we've heard in Surah Al-Araf, the shaitan promised to sit on the straight path to take people away from it, to take people to change the commands of Allah and the creation of Allah, to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No doubt the people will have a big case against the shaitan yawm al qiyamah. And that's why the ayah came here. It came after they've been to their idols and tried to get their idols to defend them. Finally, when everything is concluded, now they say it was the fault of the shaitan. The shaitan is the one who did this to me. And the shaitan will say when everything is concluded, I promised you. And he will say when everything is concluded, Allah promised you. And Allah's promise was true. Allah promised you Jannah. Allah threatened you with the fire. And Allah promised Jannah for the believers, threatened the fire for the disbelievers. Allah promised you that if you were obedient, he would give you more. If you were grateful, if you were ungrateful, he would give you a torment. Allah's promise was true. And everything I told you and everything I promised you, I lied to you. And shaitan will say, everything, I promised you that this path would be quicker for you to go to Allah. And it wasn't quicker. I promised you that you would make tawbah and you didn't. I promised you that this tree would make you live forever, but it didn't. I promised you that I was sincere to you and I was not. And everything that I promised to you, I broke my promise. And that is the nature of the shaitan. Sadaqaka wa huwa kadhub. He's a liar who breaks his promise. Do not take the promises of the shaitan. Don't listen to them. The shaitan tells you, commit this sin today. And tomorrow you'll make tawbah. He breaks his promise. Every single time. Look at the battle of Badr. He came in the form of an old man. In the battle of Badr. When he saw the angels. After he swore to them. I will be with you today. Today I'm right next to you. Don't worry. Me. I've got you here. Don't worry about it. I'm right next to you. What did he do? They looked. Shaitan has ran away. He said I saw the angels. Sorry. Goodbye. Shaitan promises you and every time he promises you, he breaks his promise. And everything Allah promises you is the true, truth. And in the ayah, الشيطان يعيدكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء والله يعيدكم مغفرة منه وفضلا والله واسع عليم Allah عز وجل, the shaitan what does he promise you? He tells you that you will be poor if you give charity. 
He tells you to do evil, immoral sins. And Allah Azza wa Jal promises you Jannah and forgiveness. And Allah told you the truth and shaitan lied. وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ I didn't have any authority over you. That's the reality of the shaitan. The shaitan never had authority. What do we mean by authority? The shaitan never had the ability to put you in Jahannam. My brothers and sisters, listen to this. Wallahi, listen to, listen to this. The shaitan never had the ability to put you in Jahannam. Rather, he gave you the invitation and you answered his invitation. And that's why the role of the shaitan is what? Is the role of the shaitan to take you by the head and pull you into Jahannam? La wallahi. The role of the shaitan is to look at you and who you are and to invite you to it, to give you an invitation. And that means the shaitan is a salesman. He knows his customer. He knows you, what you like, what you dislike, what's appealing to you. He doesn't know you like Allah knows you. He doesn't know the depths of your heart, but he knows what you like and what you don't like. He knows what is appealing to you and what is not appealing to you. He knows what will interest you and what will not. My brothers and sisters, there are people, you could put them in a brewery, in a wine shop. For a hundred years, they will never touch a bottle of it. For them, it's not a fitna at all. Other people, if you even showed them any the tiniest amount, they would run to it. There are people that every person has a fitna or fitan that appeal to them, shahawat that appeal to them. What appeals to me may not appeal to you. The shaitan knows his customer. His only job is to give you an invitation and make it look like the best thing you've ever been invited to. And how does he do that? He does it through an nafs al ammara bisu, the soul that is inclined towards evil. So what the shaitan does is he looks at your soul. What is your soul pulling you towards? What's your soul pulling you towards? So for example, if your soul is pulling you towards shahwatun nisa in the desires of women and all of this, any what is he what shaitan gonna do? He's gonna invite you to commit zina. And he's gonna make it seem like it's gonna be the best thing you cannot hold back from it. If shaitan sees your soul pulling you towards ibadah, in your worship, what's he going to do? Is he going to leave you and say, oh, subhanAllah, this is a worshiper, I can't touch him. No, no, he's going to come to you like he came to the Christian monks and get you to worship Allah with things that are not correct. To worship Allah upon ignorance, to exaggerate and go beyond the sunnah because he sees your soul is pulling you in that direction. So that's what he does. If he sees that your soul is pulling you in the direction of fame and love of this world, He's going to decorate it for you and give you a nice invitation to be world famous, to be somebody who is their name is known all over the world. Here's the invitation. Just take it. And then he's going to break his promise to you until you are with him in Jahannam. He does not have sultan over you. He doesn't pull you by the head. He doesn't grab you by the ankle and drag you into Jahannam. He just invites you to Jahannam and you answer. How foolish are we as people, as, as mankind? How foolish are we that we answer the shaitan when he invites us to Jahannam? And we don't answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he invites us to Jannah. And then the shaitan will say, I'm not going to save you. He will say, I'm not going to save you. Yani I'm not, if you're thinking now that I'm going to save you from Jahannam, I'm not going to save you and nor are you able to save me. I deny your association with me. Yani what you made partners with me before, how you made me a partner with Allah Azza wa Jal before, I, I, I denounce that. Does it benefit him anything? Does it benefit you to denounce the partnership you made with Allah in the Akhirah? No, it, it benefits you if you denounce it and make tawbah in the dunya. It doesn't, make, it doesn't benefit you when you denounce it in the akhirah. And he knows that the wrongdoers will have 
a severe punishment. وَأُدْخِلَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ تَحِيَّتُهُمْ فِيهَا سَلَامٍ And those who believed and did righteous deeds will be admitted to gardens beneath which rivers flow, abiding eternally therein by permission of their Lord, and their greeting therein will be peace. I prefer them peace, say salam. When it comes in the translation, their greeting will be salam because it's not peace. It's salam. That you now have a place where you nothing is flawed. You don't have anger, you don't have jealousy. You don't go to the toilet, you don't have impurities, you don't have times when you forget. You don't have. You're allowed to sneeze, it's okay. You don't have times where you forget, you don't have times when you when you are any tired, times when you're angry. You don't have any punishment. You don't have any chance that Allah will ever be angry with you. So Allah Azza wa Jal has truly saved you from every flaw and every problem. And so it's Dar as Salam. And the believers greet each other with Salamun Alaikum. And the angels say to you, Salamun Alaikum. Salam to you. Yani Allah has given you Salam. Allah has kept you safe. Allah has protected you. And you have nothing to fear anymore after this day and nothing will ever harm you and nothing will ever take away from your perfect life in Jannah. That's the meaning of salam. You can't, yes, sahih peace is, is, is maybe the, what you could bring, but it's not the best word. I prefer that they should say salam. Um, that the, the, their greeting in it will be salam. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَلِمَةً طَيِّبَةً كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ Have you not considered how Allah presents an example? making a good word like a good tree, whose root is firmly fixed and its branches high in the sky. In this example is one of the most beautiful examples. And it's an example that takes place over you know, two pages in Surah Ibrahim, the end of the, this page and the beginning of the next one, that Allah Azza wa Jal gives the example of a good word and the example of a bad one. And the best of the good words, and in fact, this is the intended word here before everything else, is La ilaha illallah. And the best of what this has been, the tafsir has been brought for this, is that the kalima tayyibah is La ilaha illallah. This word, Asluha thabitun wa far'uha fis sama. Its roots are strong. And its branches extend to the heavens. And I don't know, I can't do it justice to explain it in the time we have, but let me just give you an idea. When the core of your faith, La ilaha illallah, is strong, what comes out from that faith? Your salah, your zakah, the good words that you say, the good manners that you have. All of these fruits come, these branches come. Look at all the different good deeds people do in the world. The charity they give, the prayers they do, the ibadah they do, the jihad, all the things that people do. What does it all come from? All of it comes from the foundation of the tree, which is la ilaha illallah. That there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. When your aqidah is strong, when your iman is strong in Allah, all of the branches and fruits of your actions come out. تؤتي أكلها تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها عادي يا عبد الرحمن 
تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس لعلهم يتذكرون It produces its fruits all the time by permission of its Lord and Allah presents examples for the people that perhaps they'll be reminded. Shall I ask you the question that the Prophet ﷺ asked? The question that he asked and Abdullah ibn Umar knew the answer but he didn't give the answer and Umar said if I could have given all my property for you to answer that question I would have given it. He asked the question, what tree is it? Allah gives the example of La ilaha illallah like a tree. What tree? Abdullah ibn Umar knew the answer. He said to his father that, Dad, I knew, I knew what the answer to this, I knew the tree, I knew what tree it was. He said words to the effect that, son, if I could have given this and that from my property for you to have answered that question in front of the Prophet Sallallahu I would have given it. But Abdullah ibn Umar didn't answer it because he was shy to say it without being sure. The Prophet Sallallahu said, do you know which tree it is? If I'll ask you, do you know which tree it is? Of the trees in this world, which tree is it? In this world. La ilaha illallah is like one of the trees in this world. Which tree? Think of Arabia, think of the Prophet Sallallahu The date palm. The date palm. And Abdullah ibn Umar, he said to his father Umar that I knew it was the date palm. He said, son, if I had given this, this much of wealth, I would have given it for you to have answered that question in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The date palm is a tree Every single thing from it is, be is benefited from it. First of all, where does it grow? It grows in places that have very little other vegetation. And it, it can grow even in the land which does not have any, even in the land which is like a, a desert. Any. It grows in that land. Every single part of that tree, they benefit from it. I wish I could even tell you, maybe you can look it up, the benefits of date palm trees. But you will see ajaib, yani. Min ayatillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala The signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala You will see in, in the date palm Even the fibers they make from it They make from it uh, things that they the, the fibers, the palm fiber They make like ropes out of it They make things out of it The bark they make things out of it The leaves they use it The leaves they put it on top of their houses Or they use it to brush things from the road They and Every single part of that tree is benefited from and then it gives a fruit the fruit comes from time to time by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a beautiful example Allah is saying la ilaha illallah it's like the date palm if your root is solid your aqeed and your belief in Allah is strong all of the beneficial actions and beautiful fruits are going to come out from that belief now وَمَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ خَبِيثَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ خَبِيثَةٍ اجْتُثَّتْ مِنْ فَوْقِ الْأَرْضِ مَا لَهَا مِنْ قَرَارٍ And the example of a bad word is like a bad tree uprooted from the surface of the earth not having any stability. Naam, the, the, the bad word any yani those words which oppose la ilaha illallah are the worst of words. The words which contradict and go against la ilaha illallah. But otherwise, all bad words, yani the, the, the parable includes all good words. It's just that la ilaha illallah is the, is the intended word here. Like in all good words, all good things that you say, any all praise of Allah that you do, like in the ayah came regarding la ilaha illallah. And the bad word is that which contradicts or goes against la ilaha illallah, as well as all other bad words. What's the example like? Like a bad tree. Some of them said there's a kind of tree, yani it, it's like its, its taste is 
uh, its taste is uh, is bitter, and it's a tree. When you look at it, it looks uh, what's the word? Any? It looks. I wish I could remember the name of the tree. I know it in Arabic, but in English, I don't know the name of the tree. But it's like you know these like thorny bushes that that roll around in the desert, something like that. They are, they are bushes that look like thorns and, and when you put your hand in it, it cuts your hand. And if you were to eat it, it's bitter. It is uprooted from the surface of the earth. It doesn't have any stability. And it doesn't have any roots that it holds onto the earth. And if it doesn't have roots that hold onto the earth, it doesn't have la ilaha illallah. It's not based upon tawheed. And there's no, no benefit in it. It doesn't have anything. All the deeds that you bring, it doesn't bring fruit. It doesn't taste nice. It doesn't benefit the people. It doesn't look nice. It doesn't have anything good about it. Because it doesn't have a root in la ilaha illallah. يثبت الله الذين آمنوا بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ويضل الله الظالمين ويفعل الله ما يشاء Allah keeps firm those who believe with the firm word in worldly life and in the hereafter and Allah sends astray the wrongdoers and Allah does what he wills. Allah keeps firm those who believe. When does Allah keep them firm? He keeps them firm upon Islam in this life. Those who say la ilaha illallah sincerely from the heart. He makes them firm in this life. And when else does he make them firm? suali fil qabr. And that's the meaning of the ayah. Allah makes them firm during the questioning of the grave. Allah gave them la ilaha illallah in this life and Allah Azzawajal will give them la ilaha illallah when they're questioned in the grave. And that's why when you bury someone, what do you ask Allah for them? Allahumma ghfir lahu wa thabbithu. Oh Allah, forgive him and make him firm. Give him a firm word. That firm word is la ilaha illallah. And my brothers and sisters from this is that if you live upon la ilaha illallah, then bi idnillahi ta'ala you will die upon la ilaha illallah. And I don't mean la ilaha illallah as a kalima. I mean it as a life, a way of life. Worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal alone and leaving shirk in all of its forms. Completing your tawheed. If you live upon this, then you will die upon it. And Allah will make you firm with it in your grave when the angels ask you مَنْ رَبُّكْ وَمَا دِينُكْ وَمَنْ هَذَا الرَّجُلْ أَلَّذِي بُعِثَ فِيكُمْ Who is your Lord and what is your religion and who is this man sent among you? And Allah Azza wa Jal sends astray the wrongdoers. And he misguides them out of his wisdom and justice. And he does whatever he wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this, these ayat are from the greatest of the ayat of the virtue of la ilaha illallah and the virtue of tawheed and the fact that if you live upon tawheed in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you upon tawheed. When you die and when you enter your grave, Allah will give you the word of tawheed when you need it the most. When the angels ask you, مَا رَبُّكْ وَمَا دِينُكْ Allah will give you la ilaha illallah, the word of tawheed. And as for the words of shirk, Allah Azza wa Jal has not given them any stability or any fruits or any benefits that come from them. And that is why I find it so strange that people say that the kuffar have something, yani, like as though they have, they have many good things. Sahih, there might be attributes that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praised, like they, rec they recover quickly after a, after a defeat. Like in the people who praise the kuffar for what they have, their, their words, their deeds have no foundation. And if you don't bring la ilaha illallah and you don't bring tawheed, nothing comes out of your actions. Nothing is accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this, these ayat are very profound and you need to think a lot about them.
أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ بَدَّلُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ كُفْرًا وَأَحَلُّوا قَوْمَهُمْ دَارَ الْبَوَارِ Have you not considered those who exchanged the favor of Allah for disbelief and settled their people in the home of ruin? Now the people that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was sent to and they rejected his message and what they did is they set the yani they sent their people to a place of destruction meaning jahannam any meaning jahannam jahannam yaslawnaha wa bi'sal qarar it is hell which they will enter to burn and wretched is the settlement yeah وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا لِيُضِلُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ قُلْ تَمَتَّعُوا فَإِنَّ مَصِيرَكُمْ إِلَى النَّارِ And they have attributed to Allah equals to mislead people from His way. Say, enjoy yourselves for indeed your destination is the fire. I think rather than equals rivals would be a better word because equals makes it seem like they see that they're equal to Allah in every respect and they don't they they don't believe their idols are equal to Allah in every respect but they have set their idols up as rivals in worship with Allah so rivals is a is a better word here enjoy yourselves this is not a permission permission rather this is a rebuke to them do whatever you're going to do whatever little enjoyment you have because your end destination is the fire. وَجَعَلُوا قُلْ لِعِبَادِي قُلْ لِعِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَيُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَةً مِنْ قَبَلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ يَوْمُ اللَّابَيْعِ if you're going to start from there, you need to bring min qabli. Oh Muhammad, tell my servants who have believed to establish prayer and spend from what we have provided them secretly and publicly. Before a day comes in which there will be no exchange, nor any friendships. Yani there will be no ransom. You can't buy anything, you can't sell anything, you can't buy your freedom. And there will be no friend who will defend you. Allah الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل من السماء ماء فأخرج به فأخرج به من الثمرات رزقا لكم وسخر لكم الفلك لتجري في البحر بأمره وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الْأَنْهَارِ It is Allah who created the heavens and the earth and sent down rain from the sky and produced thereby some fruit some provision, as provision for you and subjected for you the ships to sail through the sea by His command and subjected for you the rivers. And He made them for your benefit. Allah Azza wa Jal made these things for your benefit. And it's subhanAllah, everything in the world, Allah Azza wa Jal سَخَّرَهَا لِيَسْتَفِيدَ مِنْهُ بَنِي آدَمْ وَمِنْهَا بَنِي آدَمْ يعني Allah Azza wa Jal لِيَسْتَفِيدَ مِنْهَا بَنِي آدَمْ يعني Allah Azza wa Jal made it for Bani Adam to take benefit from the sea, the ships, the rivers, all of that so would they not turn to worship him? وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ دَائِبَيْنِ وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ And he subjected for you the sun and the moon, continuous in orbit, and subjected for you the night and the day. 
And from this is that the sun and moon travel in an orbit, regardless of whether scientists agree with that or not. That's the truth because that's what Allah Azza wa Jal said. Any they travel in orbit. What they travel in orbit of, that is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any what does the sun travel around and what does the moon travel around, that is what Allah Azza wa Jal, any, it's, it's not what Allah has told us about. However, the sun travels in an orbit and the moon travels in an orbit along a course that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned for it. وَآتَاكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مَا سَأَلْتُمُوا وَإِن تَعُودُوا وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَظَلُومٌ كَفَّارٌ And he gave you from all you asked of him and if you should count the favor of Allah, you could not enumerate them. Indeed, mankind is generally most unjust and ungrateful. Now, this is from the ayat of, of the in'am, in the ayat of the ni'mah that Allah has given Bani Adam. Allah mentioned all those things and then Allah said, He's given you from everything that you ask for. And every time you ask for something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Azza wa Jal gives it to you. And if you were to try to count the blessings of Allah, you'll never be able to reach their number. But the general state of mankind is that you are ظلوم, extremely oppressive, and kafar, extremely ungrateful. Unless you purify yourself with tazkiyah to nafs that came, the Prophet ﷺ came with purifying yourself with Islam, cleansing your heart and your actions, the nature of mankind is to be extremely unjust and extremely ungrateful. And the word kaffar here, it means ungrateful. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ اجْعَلْ هَذَا الْبَلَدَ آمِنًا وَجْنُبَنِي وَبَنِيَّ أَنْ نَعْبُدَ الْأَصْنَامِ And mention, O oh Muhammad, when Ibrahim said, My Lord, make this city secure and keep me and my sons away from worshipping idols. And this is the beginning of the story of Ibrahim in Surah Ibrahim which is the dua that Ibrahim made. I and mean, that's what comes in. The story of Ibrahim doesn't come. But what came in Surah Ibrahim is the dua of Ibrahim. When he said, my Lord, make this city of Mecca a place of safety and keep me and my children away from worshipping idols. This, it shows al-khawf min al-shirk, being scared of falling into a partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and being scared of making a partner. Ibrahim al-Khalil, the one who is Allah's beloved servant. Ibrahim is scared of falling into shirk. رَبِّ إِنَّهُنَّ أَضْلَلْنَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ فَمَنْ تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ My Lord, indeed they have led astray many among the people. So whoever follows me, then he is of me. And whoever disobeys me, indeed you are yet forgiving and merciful. Any of those, any the, the the idols, many people were led astray. So Ibrahim is scared of being led astray by the idols, even though he is Al-Khalil. He is Al-Khalil, the one who is Allah's beloved chosen servant. He's scared of falling into worshipping the idols. Then he says, whoever follows me, he is of my religion and he is of me. And he meaning he's going to follow my religion, which is at tawheed wal ikhlas al hanifiya And whoever disobeys me, this is from the shafaqah of Ibrahim, the care of Ibrahim for his people. That if he that if he disobeys me, then oh Allah, you still forgive and have mercy. He doesn't say whoever disobeys me, send your curse upon him. And if he disobeys me, 
then oh Allah, your mercy, your mercy. And that is out of the shafaqah, the care that he has for his people. رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ فَاجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ وَارْزُقُهُمْ وَارْزُقُهُمْ عفوا make sure not to make it a dhamma يعني وَارْزُقُهُمْ يعني وَارْزُقُهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house. Our Lord, that they may establish prayer. So make hearts among the people inclined toward them and provide for them the fruits that they might be grateful. I think the word barren, I mean, uh, uncultivated is true. But maybe the word barren, people would understand it better. In a barren valley, a valley that has no vegetation. The benefit in, we can take from this ayah is first of all the story of Ibrahim when he left Hajar in a valley without any vegetation. She said, did your Lord command you this? She asked, did your Lord command you this? So what is she saying? She's saying that, O oh Ibrahim, did you make a decision to leave, leave us here? Is this your personal ijtihad that you leave us here? Or has Allah commanded you to leave us here? He said, rather Allah has commanded me. She said, then Allah will never cause us to be lost. And if it was your decision, O Ibrahim, I would have had something to say about it. I would have had to say that it's not a good decision. Why are you leaving us here? Let's go somewhere else. But you made the decision to leave us in a place because Allah commanded you. Allah will never cause us to be lost. And that's the mentality a Muslim should have. If it is Allah's command you're following, Allah will never ever cause you to be lost. If Allah's command is what you're following, never ever will you be lost. And Ibrahim here, there's an etiquette of dua, which is mentioning the outcome that you want in your dua, tawassul. One of the types of tawassul is tawassul bi dhikri al-aqibah, the mentioning the outcome you want. Rabbana li yuqimu salah. Oh Allah, I left them here to perform the prayer, so accept my dua. Now. And accept my dua by making people come towards them incline towards them and provide them from the fruits. Look at today in Mecca, every kind of fruits are available and all the produce comes into it. It's a bustling city yani in Hajj, millions of people you have there. And yet subhanAllah, it was a barren valley that didn't have anything in it at all, except that it was next to Al-Ka'bah, next to the Kaaba. Rabbana inna ka ta'lam. Rabbana inna ka ta'lam ma nukhfi wa ma nu'lin wa ma yakhfa ala Allah min shay'in fi al-ardi wa la fi al-sama. Our Lord, indeed you know what we conceal and what we declare. And nothing is hidden from Allah on the earth or in the heaven. No. Alhamdulillah alladhi wahabali ala al-kibari ismail wa isha. It's okay, but just be careful with kibar. You have to really pronounce the fatha because there's a difference between kibar, which is pride, and kibar. So make sure you really pronounce it. Alhamdulillah alladhi wahabali ala al-kibari Ismail wa Ishaq inna rabbi la sami'u dua Praise to Allah who has granted to me an old age Ismail and Ishaq indeed my Lord is the hero of supplication.
So this is part of dua al ibadah because there's two types of dua, right? Dua where you're asking for something and dua where you're not asking for anything. You're praising Allah. Both are dua. Dua al masala and dua yani the dua which is mas'ala, you're asking Allah, and the dua which is just ibadah, you're praising Allah. So he praises Allah that even though he was old, Allah gave him Ismail and Ishaq, and that Allah Azza wa is Sami'ud Dua, and he mentions his names and attributes. رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَا My Lord, make me an establisher of prayer and many from my descendants, our Lord, and accept my supplication. And he makes dua after praising Allah that Allah makes him muqeem as-salah. A regular establisher of the prayer And he pray regularly on time In the right place, in the right way And likewise from my offspring And my Lord accept my dua uh, By the way, the little kasra here Which sometimes people wonder from Especially if you're not used to Arabic This little kasra on dua in dua it, The it here means my That's why sometimes people say Where's the word my here? It doesn't say taqabbal dua i. It says taqabbal dua, but the kasra here is awadan anil ya. It's a replacement for the ya here. So taqabbal dua means taqabbal dua'i, accept my dua. Rabbana ghfir li wa li walidayya wa lil mu'minin yawma yaqumul hisab. Our Lord, forgive me and my parents and the believers the day that account is established. What a, an amazing dua this is. The dua of Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, al-Khalil. It's from, there's so much wallahi. On its own, this should be a dars. By itself, we should have a whole day just breaking down the dua of Ibrahim and what he said and the etiquettes of dua in it. And what he asked for, like it's deserving of a whole day's lesson on the topic of the dua of Ibrahim. But we just try to understand the main meanings from it. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ And never think that Allah is unaware of what the wrongdoers do. He only delays them for a day when eyes will stare, stare in horror. مُحْطِعِينَ مُقْنِعِي رُؤُوسِهِمْ لَا يَرْتَدُّ إِلَيْهِمْ طَرْفُهُمْ وَأَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَاء Racing ahead, their heads raised up, their glance does not come back to them and their hearts are void. Yani their heads are fixed in stares of terror they're not even able to move their head back to look behind. And you listen to the description of the people, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Muhti'een. They're rushing. And they're being pushed, driven by the angels. Not rushing out of glad tidings of what is coming. They're rushing out of abject terror. Muqani'i ru'usihim. Their heads are raised. لا يرتد إليهم طرفهم They cannot blink They cannot turn around They cannot look left and right Out of the terror that they are in وَأَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَى And their hearts are empty Because of the extreme fear that they are in وَأَنذِرِ النَّاسَ يَوْمَ يَأْتِيهِمُ الْعَذَابُ فَيَقُولُ فَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا رَبَّنَا أَخِّرْنَا إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ نُجِبَ دَعْوَتَكَ وَنَتَّبِعِ الرُّسُلِ أَوَلَمْ تَكُونُوا أَقْسَمْتُمْ مِنْ قَبَلُ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ زَوَالٍ And O Muhammad, warn the people of a day 
when the punishment will come to them and those who did wrong will say, Our Lord, delay us for a short term. We will answer your call and follow the messengers. But it will be said, had you not sworn before that for you there would be no cessation. Cessation. At least I think that's how you pronounce it. And he warned the people of the day when the punishment will come, what will they say? They will say, Ya Rab, put us back on the earth for a very short time. If you put us back on the earth for a very short time, we promise to answer your messengers. And we promise to yani, answer your call and follow the messengers. But Allah says, did you not swear before that my blessings in this world would never cease? Did you not swear before that you would never leave the world? That you would die and just be buried? And the blessings of Allah would keep coming upon your children and your grandchildren. Did you not swear that you would never ever leave this world? and you lived among the dwellings of those who wronged themselves. And it had become clear to you how we dealt with them. And we presented for you many examples. In the meaning they lived among the dwellings, when they used to travel, Quraysh, when Quraysh used to travel in the journeys, Quraysh used to stop at some of the dwellings of the likes of Thamud and Ad. And they would put their you know, tents there and stop there to rest for a while. And you've lived in those places. You've seen what people, how people were destroyed. And many examples have been presented to you of the people that were destroyed or many parables explaining to you the reality of this world. وَقَدْ مَكَرُوا مَكْرَهُمْ وَقَدْ مَكَرُوا مَكْرَهُمْ وَعِيَادَ اللَّهِ مَكْرُهُمْ وَإِنْ كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لِتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ And they have planned their plan, but with Allah is recorded their plan, even if their plan had been sufficient to do away with the mountains. In their plan, any, either this, there, are, there are two ways of taking the ayah. Either the ayah tells how great their plan is or how insignificant it is. These are two opposite views in the tafsir. One is that the plan says that their plan was so great that were it not for the fact that Allah had saved the believers from it, it would have destroyed the mountains. And one of the views of the tafsir is that their plan was so insignificant that it's not a plan that would do away with the mountains. And it's not a plan that could take the mountains from their place. And it did nothing against the will of Allah. Like the conclusion is they made a plan. They made a plan. But that plan had it did not come to fruition because of Allah's decree and Allah's protection. فَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْلِفَ وَعْدِهِ رُسُولَهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ ذُو تِقَامٌ So never think that Allah will fail in His promise to His messengers. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might. An owner of retribution. No. And he do not ever think that Allah will fail in his promise or that Allah will betray his promise to his messengers. They said that the, the ayah previously may have come down with regard to them trying to kill the Prophet Wasallam. And I'll, the Prophet Wasallam is told that even if they planned or plotted to kill you, Allah will always give you what he promised you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Allah's power is infinite. And Allah's ability to take retribution from the disbelievers is unrestricted. It'll be on the day the earth will be replaced by another earth and the heavens as well. And they will come. Out before Allah, the one, the prevailing. Any, the earth on the day of resurrection will not be like the earth you know. All of the ma'alim, 
the symbols of the earth. And when you come, when you travel near your home, you recognize the geography of the landscape. You recognize the mountain. You recognize this is a river near my home. This is the field before I reach my house. All of the ma'alim will be destroyed. And the earth will be replaced with a different earth. The people will not stand upon the earth that they recognize with the features of the geography and the landscape that they recognize. And they will all stand in front of Allah, Al-Wahid. There is no one other than Him deserving of worship and no one does what He does. And Al-Qahar and all of them will be subjugated and under His authority and His power, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَئِذٍ مُقَرَّنِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَادِ And you will see the criminals that day bound together in irons. Any in chains or in fetters, meaning that their necks will be bound to their hands and their feet. Like if you've seen the person who is shackled, in either an iron collar is placed on their neck and their hands and feet are tied to their neck and they can only any move in a small way. This is the meaning of muqarranina fil asfad. And they will be bound together. And some of them said that also that they, some of them said what will be bound is their hands and feet to their necks. And others said that they will also be bound to each other. And they will be chained to one another. <laughs> their garments of liquid pitch and their faces covered by the fire. Liquid pitch is like tar. You know when they, you pass by them working on the road and they have that black, thick tar that they, that they heat it in a boiling uh, vat and then they pour it in a boiling vat onto the road. That will be their garments on that day. That will be the clothes that they wear on that day and their faces will be covered by the fire. لِيَجَزِيَ اللَّهُ كُلَّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ so that Allah will recompense every soul for what it earned. Indeed, Allah is swift in account. Yeah. <laughs> This Qur'an is notification for the people that they may be warned thereby and that they may know that He is but one God and that those of understanding will be reminded. And this Qur'an is a balagh. It's a scary word what Allah says about it. Balagh. That you have been notified. That don't let anyone say that the notice was not given to you. It's like if someone was to come and to destroy, like for example, your house was to be demolished and a notice is pinned to the door that tomorrow this building will be destroyed. And your notice has been given. You have no excuse after that to say, I didn't know. The notice has been given to you. Balagh, and so that you may be warned by it, and so that you may know that no one deserves to be worshipped except Allah, and so the people of understanding would take a reminder. And that brings us to the end of Surah Ibrahim. By the grace of Allah and His mercy, it was a long session today. I said to you before the session also that it, it was likely to be long today, and we also started quite late as well. I am probably going to move the class from tomorrow 15 minutes earlier again, because our Fajr time is moving very fast backwards. So more likely than not, we will move the time again uh, 15 minutes back from what it was supposed to be this morning. We do sometimes start late. It does happen that we sometimes start a little bit late uh, in terms of getting everything ready. It depends on the masjid. I mean, sometimes people are praying, reading Quran. Sometimes people have questions and things like that. So it does sometimes take, but we, the start time for the class will get moved inshallah ta'ala tomorrow uh, 15 minutes earlier than what it was due to be scheduled for today. Hada wallahu alam wa salatu wa salam ala nabina Muhammad 
وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين